School and Globers, episode 31. Let's get it. In a world. All right, what's going on? Uh, per usual, if you want to, let me actually, I always forget for a second. Let me unmute. All right, we're good in Discord. Uh, per usual, if you want to support the stream, uh, kofi.com slash witsit. It'll pop up. We'll read it. Also, if you want to join the stream, we let people that think that the earth is, in fact, a spinning globe that we've been taught. We give them priority to pop up on the stage. You just join the Discord, raise your hand, and we'll bring you up. Um, and the link is in the description. That's Earth Awakenings on Discord. The link straight to the stage that we're on hosting the show is in the description, as always. So go ahead and join if you want to jump on the show. And then, as always, when we open it up, we want it to be on the topic of the show. If you see the title, it is about the electric field. We have kind of covered that before. I uh, feel like some people don't fully get it yet. I want to kind of break it down, play a couple videos, and open it up. So if you do want to come on, I'm going to present the information as to how the electric field on the Earth is actually impossible on the, the sphere we were told that we live on. So that's the specific reputation of the globe model. So we are hoping that someone will come and address that specifically. Um, cool. And that's about it. So we're just going to jump right into it. Let me switch my screen over for Discord so they see the presentation. Bang, bang. And then we'll come over here to the full screen. All right. All right, School and Globers, episode 31, The Electric Field. And the subtitle here is, Is the Earth's Electric Field Possible on a Globe? Let's check it out. So this is a depiction of the electric field. We're going to pull up Feynman lectures. We have been through this a few times, like I said, but I think this is one of the most precise refutations of the globe. I've come across a very uh, specific refutation of the globe recently that I think may actually be above this one. But I didn't want to bring that one out yet. I'm supposed to meet and talk to the guy from the Air Force a bit more before we go over it. So anyway, um, this is just pretty simple, right? So we have a voltage gradient, okay? And it increases 100 volts per meter up from the surface of the Earth. This has been verified many different ways. Electrometers on uh, hot air balloons that have capacitors attached to them, um, voltmeters at different altitudes. There are many different ways to measure this. Um, and like I said, this is a screenshot from the Feynman lecture. So if you see here, as the guy stands on the ground, the electric field basically conforms around him. That's because he's connected to the ground. And so as you acquire charge and you're connected to the ground, the charge is discharged into the ground, right? The surface of the earth. This is why we connect things to the ground and call it grounding it. 
Um, it's to discharge it, right? To facilitate the charge to the ground. As soon as you take the charge off, or as soon as you take the, um, the ground off of whatever object it is, it'll begin to charge back up because it will actually um, gain charge from the ambient environment. So this is what we have on the earth. And if you look very carefully, you have the ground and you have parallel uh, voltage lines, basically, right? You have a gradient and you have what's called equipotential surfaces. There's an equal amount of potential increase per distance. And in, in this, it's 100 volts per meter. Every meter, you have a 100 volts increase. It's an equal potential increase. So it's called an equipotential surface or an equipotential line. And this is what we have on the earth. If you see here, here's a depiction of a grounded metal plate, and it will have the same surface charge as the earth. If the plate is covered with a grounded conductor, it will have no surface charge. So you see here, we have two parallel plates. Um, if you've seen the level documentary, the most recent one, I actually uh, do an, an experiment um, where I show that you can take two metal plates, create um, electric gradient between the two, and you can actually flip the polarity of the field and make objects float showing that the natural uh, situation is that it's gonna go down. Of course, it's more dense in the air and there's also just a naturally occurring electric field, which is what we're discussing here. As you put, put the two parallel um, horizontal metal plates and flip the field, and you do this by using the Van de Graaff generator, that's what I used. I put the negative end of the Van de Graaff generator on the top plate, and as I began to spin the wheel, it's a little um, belt that creates friction that builds up charge, it flips the polarity of the field, the object will then go up. You can do this with pretty much any object, all right, whether that be plastic, uh, little iron filings, hair, paint chips, you, styrofoam, you name it. doesn't matter if it's insulator, if it's rubber, it doesn't really matter. It'll still go up. Now, it has to be smaller because the Van de Graaff generator I used was small, but nevertheless, it's just a demonstration showing that if you manipulate the independent variable of the electrostatic field, you can flip the direction objects go. So this is, of course, an experimentally valid demonstration of the causal mechanism of downward acceleration, commonly referred to as gravity. Now what's important here is that you see that you have two parallel plates in order to have this uh, voltage gradient. And here's another depiction of it coming up from Earth's surface from the sea level. So and we're going to get into a few videos we're going to play, but we have a linear voltage gradient that increases away from the Earth. So away from the surface, as we see here, right here, right? It increases away from the Earth, 100 volts, 200 volts, 300 volts. We have a linear voltage gradient that increases away from the Earth, which is entirely impossible around a sphere. A sphere will have a radial distribution of charge away from the surface. In addition, we actually have a uniform vertical electric field, um, and this the, the antecedent of this is perpendicular plates. So what's perpendicular to vertical? It is, of course, horizontal. So you need two horizontal plates that are parallel to each other to, to actually replicate the field that we have on, this, on the Earth. Of course, I did that in Level Documentary. Veritasium has done it. You can do it at home. It's very easy to replicate it, understanding that the surface is a plane. Of course, that's what, uh, that's what they did here. And actually, they did this when they sent the balloon up. And this is actually what capacitors are. Literally, capacitors have two parallel plates that, that utilize this fact, this volt voltage gradient, right, to give us power. That's what a capacitor does, and that's how it works. Effectively, you live within a capacitor, and that's what the evidence shows, and that's what would happen on the plane Earth. So the major problem here, and you will see that there's obviously a contrast between the two statements. One is that it's a linear voltage gradient, and then in the alternative, with the conductive sphere, you place that within an electric field, you're going to have radial distribution, okay? And, of course, this charge is going to decrease the further away you get from the surface of that sphere. So you're going to have a drop-off as you get away from the surface, and you're going to have a radial distribution, basically. This is a way to conceptualize that. You'll have concentric circles. So you see the, the, the interior circle would be the, the Earth being a sphere, and then you have this out, um, outer circle that they uh, depict as the ionosphere here, you would have tons of little concentric circles with, in between the two. And each circle would get bigger and bigger, right? So that would create a greater volume. Now the charge is going to distribute away from the surface, feeling the greater and greater volume, and it's going to distribute radially, right? Because it's a sphere. And so it's going to drop off as you get away from the surface. Now what do we see in reality? We actually see that the voltage gradient increases away from the surface. Again, if we were on a conductive sphere, we would have concentric equipotential surfaces. There would be a radial distribution and there would be a drop off away from the surface. But rather we see 
uh, parallel horizontal equipotential surfaces. We see a uniform electric field. We see a linear voltage gradient and we see an increase away from the surface. And again, this is, this is the depiction that you will find online. Um, but admittedly, no one really understands it within the sphere paradigm. So here are the questions that we have tonight. <clears throat> the first one is, why does the electric voltage gradient increase away from the surface of the earth? And there should be another one, yep. Second question is, why is the electric voltage gradient on the earth linear? And there are many sub questions, right? Like why is it uniform? Why do we have a uniform vertical electric field? How do you have a, ver a uniform vertical electric field without um, two perpendicular surfaces that are parallel to one another? Now, of course, all this is easy to explain on a plane. Here, there's some type of surface above us that we do not have access to. It's parallel to the ground. And uh, this is why you have it increased from the surface. This is why you have a linear distribution. This is why you have a uniform distribution. It's a major problem for a sphere. Again, it will be radial. It will not be uniform. And you do not have the antecedent of the parallel Gaussian surfaces. So we've covered this quite a bit. Some of this may have gone over your head. I encourage anyone to uh, at me with any types of questions. We're gonna open it up in a second. So we'll make sure that people can fully understand it. Uh, this is an absolute death blow to the sphere. Um, this is absolute death blow to the claim that a plain earth could not explain the phenomena referred to as gravity. Um, and we'll get into more of those specifics and some of the typical uh, contentions that people use and show what's wrong with them. But again, this is a very straightforward question here, right? Why does the electric voltage gradient increase away from the surface of the earth? Why is the electric voltage gradient on the earth linear? And this is within the context of someone that believes the earth's a sphere. Wouldn't it be a radial distribution of charge? Wouldn't it decrease as you get further away from the surface of the earth? The answer is of course, yes. So I wanna show you guys a couple videos. So I think we'll start with this one. This guy actually, um, he runs what's called a corona motor. It's an electrostatic generator. He does this utilizing this uh, vertical uh, field on the earth, right? So he uses the um, linear voltage gradient to actually run this generator. Very fascinating. He kind of breaks it down, gives you some depictions. So it is five minutes long, but I'm gonna watch it. Hopefully the Discord can hear it. I think they should be able to once I switch over to YouTube for them. And let me come over here. Bang. All right, so everyone should be able to hear it. Just give me feedback in the YouTube chat or the Discord chat if you guys can't hear it. And then I will be back. Hi, gang. I'd previously demonstrated generating power using atmospheric electricity. A hexacopter was used to lift one end of a wire high up into the air. Meanwhile, the other end of the wire was connected to a corona motor near the ground. Electricity then flowed through the wire and corona motor, making it turn. In this video, I'm going to explain how it works. Much of the following explanation is adapted from Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman's lecture on physics, a section called Electricity in the Atmosphere. For every meter you go up in the air, the voltage increases by around 100 volts, or we could say around 100 volts per yard. We can draw these voltage increases using what are called equipotential lines. Notice that the ground is negative and the sky is positive with respect to each other. According to Feynman, this extends upward to 50 kilometers, or 31 miles where the air is very conductive. This is the case in fair weather. In stormy weather, like a thunderstorm, things are quite different, and I won't talk about that here. But if this voltage exists between your head and the ground, why don't you get a shock? The reason is that your body is a good enough electrical conductor that standing on the ground, you're basically a part of the ground. The equipotential lines would look like this. There's still effectively zero volts between the top of your head and ground. Similar effects happen with trees, buildings, and so on. What about the electric current? A downward electrical current exists and consists of positive ions. Molecules are clumps of matter that have a positive charge. These ions are moving slowly toward the ground. The current density from these ions is very small. Around All right, we'll use this to point out that there really is no such thing as negative and or positive charge. It's just a concept that we use. Any physicist worth their salt will tell you that it was an arbitrary determination. We have some type of propaganda story about Benjamin Franklin and stuff. That aside, it could go either way. There are no p positives and negatives floating around in the world. Of course, there are no negatives in nature whatsoever. 
right? We call the phenomena of charging, the process of charging up positive. We call the process of discharging negative charge, okay? So they're events, they're processes. There are no actual plus signs or minus signs. There are no distinct different types of charges. There is just charge, and there's the process of charging or discharging. But for intents and purposes, based on the actual, um, you know, parameters that we kind of have understood electricity so far, we'll rock with it. I just want to make sure that that's clear because that will actually come up in this discussion almost guaranteed. So let's continue. Molecules are clumps of matter that have a positive charge. These ions are moving slowly toward the ground. The current density from these ions is very small, around 10 micro micro amps, or 10 pico amps, crossing each square meter or yard every second. So in any small area, there's not a lot of power. And that's the explanation about atmospheric electricity adapted from Feynman's lectures. To take advantage of this atmospheric electricity, we electrically connect one end of a wire to the ground and lift the other end up into the air. In our case, we got good results at around 120 meters, or 390 feet up. At 100 volts per meter, or 100 volts per yard, that's 12,000 volts between that height and the ground. But, just as with you standing on the ground, the wire is an electrical conductor, and so is also at ground potential. Looking at the equipotential lines around the wire, that voltage of 12,000 volts exists between some distance away from the wire and the wire. You can see that the equipotential lines are closest together at the top of the wire. This means the attraction is strongest there, and electrons make their way upward in the wire. Let's look more closely at the top of the wire. We'd put six sharp points using sewing pins at the top of that wire. But for ease of illustration, I'll draw just one. Notice that because of the sharp shape at the point, the charges are crowded together at that point. Remember also that there are positively charged ions in the air. An electric field exists between the negative charges on the wire and the positive charges in the air. And we can represent that electric field by drawing lines between pairs of opposite charges. Notice that the electric field lines are closer together near the point, meaning the electric field is stronger there. It's strong enough to remove the negative electrons from the sharp point, where they neutralize positive ions. But due to the voltage, there are fresh positive ions moving downward and fresh negative charges coming up from the wire. We now have electricity flowing through the wire. The electric current in that electricity is very weak though. We didn't measure it, but from my experience with electrostatics, I'd estimate it in the low microamps, or more likely even lower. That's not enough to turn an electromagnetic motor, one like you use in everyday life, but it is enough to turn an electrostatic motor, like this corona motor. The corona motor consists of a plastic cylinder surrounded by sharp-edged metal blades. Every second one of those blades is connected to the wire going up into the sky. That means that when the wire starts conducting, those blades are now at whatever voltage the top of the wire is up in the sky, though opposite in polarity, positive. That's why you get a shock when you touch one of those wires. Okay, sorry, I gotta unmute three different things. So, um, we, we'll watch the last minute, but I just wanna show you guys this is real life application of it. I get that it's kinda dry and the music is, uh, the song's a real banger. We'll watch the last minute, then we're gonna pop over and we're gonna watch my boy Good Times for All explain it, and then we're gonna watch just like a minute and a half of um, an MIT professor, and then we'll we'll kind of close it up and open it up. But um, I know that it's maybe a bit hard to pay attention, that's why I'm talking real fast. Just like, stick with me, this is super important. Um, and once again, shocker, what we see in reality perfectly matches not only a plain Earth's ability to explain it, but its exact prediction, and we are able to replicate it. Um, this is a major problem for the globe. I've talked to a former or a physicist that works at CERN. I've talked to electrical engineers. There, there is no answer. Um, so hopefully we'll get one tonight, but uh, we'll finish this off and then we'll move to the next video. Negative charge is then pulled from the plastic cylinder through a gap between the edge of the blade and the cylinder. That leaves the cylinder with the same charge, and since like charges repel, a repulsion occurs that rotates the cylinder. The next blade is connected to earth ground and becomes negatively charged, and since opposite charges attract, it attracts the charged area of the cylinder. It then neutralizes that charged area by taking electrons from the ground. And that's how atmospheric electricity can power an electrostatic motor like a corona motor. And obviously there's a lot of, sorry, there's obviously a lot of conceptual problems with that uh, explanation, the reification of little spheres, you know how they love their little spheres. But anyway, um, I see someone ask if there is a link to the Van der Graaff generator test. Um, I'm sure someone can drop it, go to Hibbler Productions on YouTube, you'll see the level documentary, you can uh, skip through it till you'll see that I did it. 
Um, and I'll also show you this while we're at it. So this is someone levitating an object, and we'll just kind of skip some of this here. This is actually a conductive object, of course, and you can do it with anything. You can do it with, again, insulators. So you can do it with rubber, you can do it with glass, you can do it with styrofoam, you can do it with paint, iron filings, you name it. Um, it is actually independent of the specific material that you are using. It is manipulating the bias, and if that bias of the due to the polarity of the field overcomes the distribution of the object relative to its medium that is of course based on density and then what we call weight which is a side subject that we can talk about then it will go up so if you see here you're going to see it floating I'm, i think he is talking so look first of all this phenomenon is flat up mesmerizing and often small objects can hover perfectly as if held up by a string but this isn't about strings or something that you can see Okay, obviously, if you look here, you're going to see that there are two parallel plates. This is how you replicate it. Let's listen to my boy, Good Times for All, kind of explain it. This is just 30 minutes. Hello, everybody out there in YouTube land. This is Good Times for All. There's Zachary Zabala here, if you prefer. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at why the force of gravity is electric potential. In a gravitational field, matter, like a piece of chalk, wants to go from high potential to low potential. If I just release it with zero speed... For all of those that love to appeal to authority, this is not some scrub. This is Walter Lewin, very famous and well-revered and respected MIT professor. There it goes. High potential to low potential. In analogy, positive charges will also go from a high electric potential to a low electric potential. And of course, this is unique for electricity, negative charges will go from a low potential to a high electric potential. So let's really soak that in what he's saying there. It's going to actually go where it goes based on potential. Let's listen to it one more time. Think about where we live. Also go from a high electric potential to a low electric potential. And of course, this is unique for electricity. Negative charges will go from a low potential to a high electric potential. So let's take a look at what Walter Lewin is saying and apply it to what we see here on Earth. Up oh, real fast. Shout out to Ron Boston Bear. I guess he grabbed the level documentary with the timestamp. So we'll pop this up as well. Um, yeah, and this is how science works. You're able to replicate things. Um, don't worry about how goofy I look. All right. Let's finish this out. And if you have any questions at me, um, if I miss it, you can always, you can just drop a couple bucks and it'll pop up on the screen. I should see it if you at me in the chat, though. We have the ground, which is our negative. And the electric potential grows 100 volts every meter it gains an elevation so in the air up here at around three meters you will have 300 volts per meter of atmosphere if we were to place an object right here at this elevation it would gather the charge surrounding it at 300 volts per meter now if you release it it will accelerate down towards the negative because there is a difference in electric potential there. It wants to go towards the negative, which is the ground. This is why we see so many similarities with electric field equations and gravitational field equations because this is how it works. This positive above us and negative below us is polarizing everything in it and going from the positive to the negative. It's that easy. And we'll show you here in this demonstration. So what I've done here is taken the Van de Graaff generator to separate the charges, but instead of doing it like the Earth is with the positive on top and negative on the bottom, I've reversed it. 
So the negative is on the top, positive is on the bottom. And you will see as I start applying a current here that it will polarize the piece of tissue paper and then become attracted towards the negative plate. Okay, so this is the same thing that I did. So again, to make sure you understand, the way that you have this, this vertical voltage gradient that is linear is you have two parallel plates, creates a finite volume, a certain amount of space, right? So now the charge is gonna distribute based on that space. It changes at the edges, right? Because you're starting to lose that finite volume. And so when we do it mathematically, we treat the parallel surfaces as if they are infinite. That means that if you're on a plain earth, it would begin, the electric field would begin to change at the quote unquote edges, wherever that would be, if the containment touches down or whatever. If it were to go on infinite, it would remain the same everywhere. The point here is that what you do is you take this fan graph generator and you put, you put the negative on the top, which is the opposite of the way it naturally is on the earth and things will actually go up. Now, why is that? It would be incredibly naive and ignorant to ignore the role of this in why we see things go down on the earth. Now, this is not specifically about gravity per se, but it's a two for one here, right? This shows that we cannot be living on a sphere due to the linear voltage gradient, the lack of radial distribution, the uniformity of the vertical electric field. It also gives you an explanation of gravity. So if you pay attention, he just flips the polarity of the field by putting the negative plate on the top. And of course the plate itself is not negative, it's attached to the Van de Graaff generator. Basically we're discharging on the top plate, it flips the polarity and it makes the object go up. I will, I will address the common rebuttals and you will see there really is no rebuttal. This is just the negative like the earth is with the positive on top and negative on the bottom, I reversed it. So the negative is on the top, positive is on the bottom. And you will see as I start applying a current here that it will polarize the piece of tissue paper and then become attracted towards the negative plate. This is just like we see here in reality. There is a force that is being created, an electrical force. It's that simple. It really is that simple. Um, here is Walter Lewin explaining it a bit more in depth. I know we're watching a bunch of videos, but I'm trying to give it, you the information in different ways, so maybe it clicks. I wonder what the hell holds the nucleus together if there is such a tremendous force on these protons. Well, what is holding them together are the nuclear forces, which we do not fully understand, but thank goodness the nuclear forces are not part of 802, so I'll leave that alone for now. So what holds our world together? Well, on the nuclear scale, 10 to the minus 12 centimeters, very important are the nuclear forces. On an atomic scale, up to thousands of kilometers, it's really electric forces that hold our world together. But on a much larger scale, planets and stars and the galaxy, it is gravity that holds our world together. Look this in for a second. So it is gravity that holds our world together on the bigger scale. Is that so? So what you're saying is on the actual scale that's accessible, the actual scale that we experience, the one where we don't begin to reify ideas about light in the sky, everything that holds, the force that holds everything together is electric. But oh, now, now you're maybe starting to put together why it's not considered viable as an explanation for gravity in the mainstream consensus at the moment. Why is that? Because if gravity, as it were coined, is electrostatic, it wouldn't explain what we see in the sky. Okay, it would be way too weak. For the alleged masses and distances that they claim, electrostatics could not cause the motion that we observe. Now, spoiler alert, what we've been told about the sky is incorrect, the medium's incorrect, the distances is incorrect, the masses are incorrect. It's a bunch of reified mathematical concepts. The medium itself changes everything. But also, I would say, it appears to be electromagnetic in the sky. Everything is. We just have a voltage, electric voltage gradient with a uniform vertical electric field on the surface of the Earth. Uh, things begin to discharge, and that creates the bias. So I wanted to point that out just so you understand what he's, he's pointing out. He's like, well, on the Earth, in reality, that we can actually test, 
right? It's really electric forces that hold everything together. But when we get into the giant scale of galaxies and planets, all of a sudden it's gravity is needed. Now they can't define gravity, it doesn't work, et cetera, but we're not gonna get into that. I just wanna make sure you guys see the difference here. We're gonna actually discuss the Earth, what is the Earth, what's going on on the Earth, and then we're not going to jump over into fairy tale, reify the sky based on mathematical models. We're gonna stick on the Earth. And any idea that we come up with cosmologically must conform to actual testable reality that's accessible. If it does not, it is wrong. If it's a paradox, it is wrong. If it has no evidence, it is wrong. So he's gonna really break down exactly how, now I want you to keep in mind, right? When you have like electrostatic charge, what happens? Well, you'll have things quote unquote attract, right? Really they accelerate towards each other. And I want you to think about what they claim gravity does and think about, would you be able to isolate that? I don't wanna divert into gravity too much, but it does play directly into the field, so. All right, let me come back over. And I'm sorry, I know Discord couldn't see me while I was talking, but let me come over. But on a much larger scale, planets and stars and the galaxy it is gravity that holds our world together. Oh, okay, so pretty simple, pretty simple. And I guess we will play this real fast, why not? And then we're going to um, wrap it up. Okay. We test this we can use something called a corona motor and whenever we manipulate electrostatics we can make things levitate we can make things go up or down and we can actually change how fast they go down we can also manipulate the weight of an object oh dude i hate hearing myself so the uh the corona motor is what we watched the video about earlier atmospheric electricity is a corona motor electrostatic generator simply by manipulating electrostatics and of course that's how science actually works is you do an experiment that shows you what the cause of the effect is and you can manipulate electrostatics and cause the effect of downward acceleration commonly referred to as gravity of course i've never seen a test that manipulates space-time and you will never see that it doesn't exist everyone thinks that the reason things fall is because of gravity but actually everything that exists is electrostatic so whenever things go to the ground, they're seeking equilibrium. So they go find their balance on the ground where their charge disperses or spreads out in through the ground. So we have positive charge in the air. We have negative charge on the surface of the earth or on the ground, which is why it's called grounding. And then we introduced positive charge and then it went back down to the ground to seek equilibrium. This shows that that's actually what objects do when they fall to the ground. They go to the ground because of the electric forces and they seek equilibrium on the earth. We knew about it. as. A... All right, cool. Um, let me pop over back to this. Let me explain the PowerPoint one last time and then we're gonna open it up. And uh, I did use, obviously I use positive and negative, the terminology there, it's because the video is to wake people up and we don't have time to divert into that at that time, obviously. But anyway, um, I, wanna, I wanna cover this one more time. So we have a linear voltage gradient that increases away from the earth, which is entirely impossible around the sphere. Okay, and you don't have to believe me. We can actually look at, my boy, it is kind of annoying. I have to change it on Discord as well. All right, this is from the Feynman lectures, right? And I mean, people love to say like, oh, you think all scientists are wrong and blah, blah, blah. Well, this is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, very famous, Richard Feynman, and I don't really care about him, right? This evidence is uh, tested independent of any individual, right? And so one I wanna show you. So uh, some of them may be discharged by ions collected from the air, but the current of these is very small because the air is a poor conductor, but it does act as an insulator, right? And so here we have what we showed you earlier. Another thing that can be measured in addition to the potential gradient, this is the point of this stream, right, is because this is actually impossible, this vertical uh, voltage gradient. But anyway, 
is the current in the atmosphere. The current density is small, about 10 micro microamps crosses each square meter parallel to the earth. Okay, so over a very small area, the current is very weak. Okay, makes sense actually, right? The air is evidently not a perfect insulator and because of this conductivity, a small current caused by the electric field, we have just been describing passes from the sky down to the earth, right? We come back down here, and I've gone through this a few times for sure. Although the electric current density in the air is only a few micro microamps per square meter, there are very many square meters on the Earth's surface. The total electric current reaching the Earth's surface at any time is very nearly constant at 1800 amps. This current, of course, is quote unquote positive. It carries plus charges to the Earth. So we have a voltage supply of 400,000 volts with a current of 1800 amps, a power of 700 megawatts. Now, it would actually be greater than that if you don't assume the finite distances and dimensions of the Earth that we were told. Now, the point is that what people will say to you, and I just wanna give you a few more depictions here, and it really, I encourage people to read this. It really breaks down. Um, when they first checked this out, it was a surprise because they went up, they weren't expecting it. And let's see. Yeah, look, to test this theory, some physicists carried an experiment up in balloons to measure the ionization of the air that's Hess in 1912, and discovered that the opposite was true. The ionization per unit volume increased with altitude. That is a major globular problem. The apparatus was like that of figure 9-3. Here you go. Now, this is just effectively operating as a capacitor. It's an electrometer. The two plates were charged periodically to the potential V. Due to the conductivity of the air, the plates slowly discharged. The rate of discharge was measured with the electrometer. This was a most mysterious result, the most dramatic finding in the entire history of atmospheric electricity. So what did they do? They started making up ideas. They started reifying the idea of an ionosphere and they started to explain that it must be because of cosmic rays. Because what should happen? There should be a radial distribution that decreases away from the surface of the earth. That is a major problem for the sphere. So if we come back over here, we have a linear voltage gradient that increases away from the Earth, which is entirely impossible around a sphere. A sphere will have a radial distribution of charge away from the surface. So just a reminder, you have the sphere, you have concentric circles out from there, as opposed to what? Two parallel plates like we see here. Now, if the Earth's a plane, you would have a surface above you, you would have this, it would give you finite volume, it'd give you a vertical electric field that would be perpendicular to those plates. Perpendicular to vertical is horizontal. You would have two horizontal parallel plates and then our surfaces, Gaussian surfaces, and then you would have a vertical electric gradient or voltage gradient in between those two. And this would actually give you um, a downward bias, right? So a major problem is the radial distribution. So the question is, why does the electric voltage gradient increase away from the surface of the earth when we know that if you were to take a conductive sphere, put it in an electric field, the charge will be strongest near the, near the uh, surface. I said balloon because to make sure you understand it, imagine taking a balloon, rubbing it on your head. Where's the charge going to be the strongest? At the surface. And it's going to drop off the further you get away from the surface of that balloon, right? The balloon will operate as this spherical earth, okay? It's going to drop off and it's actually going to exponentially or dramatically, drastically drop off as you get further and further away from the surface because you have a radial distribution, okay? But that's not what we see on the earth. We see an increase, 100 volts per meter, not just an increase, equipotential increase, 100 volts per meter. So the consistency, the lin linearity, and the uniformity are major problems for the spherical assumption. So why does the electrical voltage gradient increase away from the surface of the earth? That is the first question. Second question is why is the electric voltage gradient on the earth linear? Major, major problem because it's supposed to be radial if there is a sphere. Again, if you have a sphere, you'll have concentric circles coming out from there. You could cl call those equipotential surfaces. The problem is that you wouldn't have an equal potential increase, right? For one, it would decrease away from the surface of the sphere and it would be radial, not linear. Those are antonyms, okay? What do we see on the earth? We see a linear voltage gradient. This is a major problem for a spherical assumption. And so again, we're gonna open it up, but I want the subject to to be what is discussed, right? We have two questions on the table. Um, the questions show a direct refutation of the claim that the Earth is a globe. 
and I'll make sure that everyone understands it. It's pretty simple, right? But why does the electric voltage gradient that we observe on the Earth, it increases away from the surface when we know it should be decreasing within a spherical globe model? Away from the surface should be strong to the surface and decrease away from there. It's not what we see at all. And secondly, right, why is the electric voltage gradient on the Earth linear, which I would consider one of the, the most lethal refutations of the globe model? So there you go. That is the presentation. Let me uh, come over here. All right, sorry, I forgot to switch it back to the PowerPoint for Discord. All right, we're gonna open it up to anyone that wants to um, ask the questions. Again, if you wanna support the stream, link is right there, kofi.com slash quits it, it'll pop up. I saw there was a donation, we'll check them periodically. Um, and then if you want to jump on and have a discussion, uh, click the link in the description. It's Earth Awakenings Discord. It'll take you straight to the stage um, that we're in if you actually click the link in the description. And then we'll bring you in. If you wanna jump up, just raise your hand. We'll bring you on the stage. And of course, the rules are pretty simple. No interrupting. Try to keep your points somewhat concise. Respect the room, respect others. Um, and just have a good faith interaction. Um, we don't need any gaslighting. We don't need any stereotyping. We don't need any um, interruptions. We don't need people using any sophistry, which is the use of fallacious arguments with the intention to deceive. We're all on the same team. We're all people that are just trying to figure out what the truth is. We were all told a specific thing about what the earth is, and the discussion should be respectful and hopefully edifying. So that is really the only rules is keep it pertinent to the subject. Don't interrupt. Try to keep it somewhat concise, and then we should be able to actually have a good discussion. So, okay, I think we're good. If anyone that's already on the stage has anything they want to say, uh, let me know. I see a few people. I think three of these people may be quote unquote glow earthers. Um, raise our awareness. What's going on? What's up? Hey, what's up, man? How's it going? Good. What's going on, bro? Hey, so I don't necessarily have a particular answers to those questions that you put forth. Okay. I mean, what do you think about it? Well, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you why there was an equal potential increase in voltage. Uh, but I, do, I was looking at this one Reddit post from about, uh, I think it was a few months ago. Yeah, like three months ago. And... There was this one individual named um, something weekly. Actually, can't look very funny. Electro weekly. And uh, basically, which I can't really find it right now. I was wondering if there's any chance you could pull it up and share the link and read through what he wrote, and then potentially respond to it. If not, no big deal. What's it called? Uh, I would look up schooling with it, Reddit, oh, Ga it. and then Gazi and services. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. First of all, I'll look it up in a second. But um, this this one is actually not even about the surfaces, right? It's about the fact that the so they'll have to try to come up with another explanation or whatever. I'll read it in a second. But it's that yeah. the field that we have on the Earth is linear. So there's a uniform vertical electric field. The voltage gradient is linear. On a sphere, it would be radial. All right, so I'll okay, look it yeah. up. I highly doubt that they address that whatsoever. It's probably something to the effect of equipotential surfaces or Gaussian surfaces are just a mathematical construct. They don't actually exist, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yes, and so in, in the two Gaussian surfaces would be the Earth, and then what's the other one? Is, is it some... the what it's is some, that, the ionosphere? Well, that, well, I don't know. I don't think it's the ionosphere. I think there's some type of containment above us that creates finite volume. The reason the ionosphere doesn't really work is because they claim the ionosphere constantly changes which altitude it's at, which mean that the electric field would constantly change how many volts it would increase per meter because it would change the amount of volume. That's not what we see. We see a very consistent, uniform, linear voltage gradient that has 100 volts per meter. So, the globe may try does, to claim uh, that, but so what? What about the dome? Do you, first off, I am kind of a newbie listener. My brother is a lot long term of a follower, but 
do you believe there is a dome? And if so, would that not have additional issues? Um, being a, is that not part of the, is that not a Gaussian service? The curved dome? Yeah, so there's a few answers to that. One is that the dome can, of course, just be kind of low to the surface. So at the edges, it's going to come up, and then it would come across effectively parallel to the ground and then come back down. It doesn't have to be this giant arcing dome that people draw with cartoons, right? It could just, it could come up off the surface at the edge and then come across pretty low and parallel to the ground and pop back down. And there could be something else acting as a solid that just there are parallel layers within a dome, right? There are parallel later layers. Um, you could basically have like plasma turning into something akin to a super solid or something. And what would happen is if whatever the dome is containing, you would have parallel layers within that. Those would be parallel horizontal layers. So both of those would work. And again, like I said in the presentation, where it would be different in that scenario is when you get out close to wherever the edge, quote unquote, is, or wherever a container would come back down, the, the electric field would change. Of course, inconveniently, you can't actually go out that far and test it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's interesting. I, I actually want to go do that. But uh, yeah, and that's why I brought up the way that we do it mathematically, we assume infinite surfaces, that way the math works, but in reality, as you get closer to the surface or to the edge, it begins to drop off, right? The, the voltage gradient changes. Um, but the more, more of the point is that what we see is that the vertical electric field is linear. The voltage gradient is linear on the earth, and if it, we were on a sphere, it would be radial, which is a major... It's a major globe problem. Also, yeah, that, that, that is interesting. Would it would be radial only over long distances, though. Would it be radial only over long distances? No, it, it would be radial as soon as you got away from the surface of the Earth. You could try to say, if you were really, really close, that it would look kind of similar. But of course, we know that you keep going higher and higher and higher, and it remains linear, right? It would be radial as soon as you go away, right? Because like, if I'm standing on the Earth and you're standing on the Earth, even just a hundred feet away from me, you're technically at a different angle than I am because we're both going down relative to the center of mass. So if I'm standing here and then you're like a hundred miles away, it's going to be even more different, right? And then as soon as we go up just one mile, now we have a whole mile of that charge distributing radially. But what we actually see in reality is if I'm on a mountain that is 30,000 feet and you're at a mountain that's 30,000 feet and we're hundreds of miles away, we're going to have the exact same voltage gradient and it's going to be linear all the way to the ground. So that's what we see in reality is a linear electric field all the way up and it would be a radial distribution immediately from the surface. I can go ahead and try to tell you like the still man of the globe, the best they can try to say is, well, it's, an, it's, it's flat for intents and purposes on the small scale in small sections and when you're close to the surface, it would look like it's uniform. But that doesn't, that doesn't work because it doesn't just look uniform near the surface. It remains uniform and vertical and linear all the way up with immense distances between us. And it's not just like, oh, I'm just going to look at like a mile. It's, it's like, no, we, we look at hundreds or thousands of miles and it remains the same, right? So, Yeah, so those would be rebuttals by uh, Globers if they hadn't done their actual homework. It, yeah, it would be the best, the best clip. But I mean, honestly, I can say I can't think of a Stillman rebuttal to the linearity of the voltage gradient. I've never heard one. I talked to a CERN physicist for an hour, and he did not have one. He ended up conceding. So I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, I will look this up. Schooling wits it. Is that what you said? Yeah, schooling wits it. Um, and Gaussian surface on Reddit. Yeah. Let's see if I it's was a, right about what he says. Yeah. I'm assuming he's going to say... It's Electro Weekly. The comments by Electro Weekly, and it's like a few downs from three months ago. Starts out with Witsit's latest argument. Yeah, let me share it to the stream. We'll read it live. Ooh. We'll do it live. Hell yeah. Uh, I got money that it's like, Gaussian servers are just mathematical constructs. I, I think it does say that, actually. I know, because that's the best thing you want to come up with. Wait, let's just read it. Let's just read it live. Um, and now point out what's obviously wrong with that. Ooh. All right. Here we go. I don't and, see it on the screen. Yeah, let me change it for the Discord. Let me do it. 
All right, you guys should see it now. All right, in last week's episode of Schooling Globers, Flair so stupid, we may have entire Reddit posts about it. Witsit presents possibly his dumbest argument yet. Interesting. Uh, he has been presenting questions he thinks that no Glober can answer. His most recent question is, can you have equipotential lines in a vertical electric field without two Gaussian surfaces? Uh, yeah, and actually, like, a uniform vertical electric field. The question itself shows that he doesn't understand the very nature of Gaussian surfaces or equipotential lines. And the more he talks, the more he shows his lack of knowledge. More details in the comments. This episode was memeable that I couldn't just choose one. It was so memeable. All right, we'll come down. This is him, I think. Uh, let's see. What's yeah, his art? Yeah, yeah. Equal uh, electric potential above the surface of the Earth, and that you need to have two Gaussian surfaces to store the electric charge. Didn't say that. This creates a finite volume to equalize the charge within that volume. That's more accurate relative to the negative and/or positive charge of the plates. I may have said that and therefore generates the equipotential lines. He also claims that scientists invented the concept of the ionosphere so that they could pretend this acts as one of the two guiding surfaces with the surface of the Earth being the other. Sort of what I said. It's all very tactical strawmans. They came up with that because of the radio transmissions. But now it's true that there's a measurable voltage above the surface of the Earth. You can draw a line joining different locations with the with the potential, or the potential is equal. These are the equipotential lines at which it discusses. There is nothing special about these lines. They do not need a container. These are no more physical than lines of equal pressure that you might see on a weather forecast. <laughs> the Gaussian surface is essentially just a mathematical concept for calculating the flux of an electromagnetic field or any field. It is an imaginary surface. Even the source that which it uses to introduce the concept describes the Gaussian surface as imaginary. And of course, we will go right back here to Feynman Lectures, and we will show that real this plate. is a real life depiction of metal plates. We'll also look here where I'm literally doing it with real metal plates, and we'll also look right here where Zach is doing it with real metal plates okay so these are not just math oh real metal plates so when you want to actually replicate a vertical electric field that's linear with a with equipotential surfaces right an equipotential distribution of charge then you use two actual real life physical surfaces metal plates now no one that knows anything about this would tell you that these are not gaussian surfaces that's what they are you can use a mathematical construct of that Right, you can use a Gaussian surface as a mathematical construct. I've said that specifically in the stream, which of course he tactically does not point out. He acts like I didn't know that, but okay. Anyway, even the source that what's it uses, okay, yeah, wrong. Witsit glosses over the fact that text is presenting a particular choice of Gaussian surface that leverages symmetry to simplify the uh, uh, calculations. Not the point, actually. The point is, and that's not true either. So we'll go back to Feynman. He doesn't say that we're using this to simplify the equations. He points out that the actual measurements of the field on the Earth is such that to replicate it, you would use two parallel metal plates. He then points out that it was an absolute shock and surprise when people found it out. So wrong again. <laughs> Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. That's no, not working. All right. Um, he presents this as actual rules about how a Gaussian surface behaves. You can actually choose any appropriate surface to use as a Gaussian surface. So as long as it's closed surface that encloses a 3D volume. However, this means the surface of the Earth explicitly cannot be a Gaussian surface. What? What? Also, the dome firmament could not be a Gaussian surface either. In fact, this whole premise of requiring two Gaussian surfaces is entirely flawed for this reason. Incorrect again. I just explained it as I did in that stream multiple times. I do find that the, the reoccurring theme of having to tactically misrepresent and remove the clarity and explanations to the alleged rebuttals is pretty telling. Ignoring this fundamental flaw in which it's argument, he goes on to claim that the Gaussian surface must be perpendicular to the field. Again, this is untrue. He got this from the source above that choose a Gaussian Gaussian surface in this way to simplify the equations. You can choose a different Gaussian surface, which is not perpendicular to the field, and the calculations will still work just fine. They're just more complicated. This is where he shows his ignorance. Ironically, he continues to conflate math with reality. So I'm talking about a measurable real electric field in reality, what we see on the earth and the way that you can physically demonstrate it in reality. The fact that you can try to mathematically describe an electric field with different types of uh, theoretical surfaces that are not physical is not the point. And I guarantee you, he's not going to talk about in the last couple paragraphs about how I pointed out it's a uniform vertical electric field and the linearity of it is the problem. Next, he tries to imply that scientists have invented the ionosphere to be their Gaussian surface. 
Well, they actually invented the ionosphere because Marconi's radio transmissions went far beyond what the globe predicts, so they had to come up with an idea, and Oliver Heaviside is the one that came up with it, of a reason that the radio waves would reflect back down as they went towards space as the curved surface of a globe would go down and away from the line of sight horizontal transmission of a radio wave. They did not go up there and discover it. They theorized it based on what would be needed for the globe. They then used that same idea to try to invoke the second Gaussian surface. Um, Anyway, he says that scientists would have to prove in a lab that a plasma like that in an ionosphere could store a charge in the way he mistakenly thinks a Gaussian surface does. Um, Never said anything about storing a charge. I said it creates a finite volume between the two plates, and then the charge actually distributes relative to that finite volume. This is just basic, basic laws of electrostatics. Um, And I did not even say what he's saying about what they need to prove in a lab, other than they would need to show an actual uh, equipotential, equipotential distribution Right, and uniformity of the electric field within a condu- with a conducting sphere inside of electric field without a physical Gaussian surface around it. And even if it did exist, it would be a concentric circle that was much bigger than the sphere itself, which would cause a radial distribution. That is the actual argument that no one has rebutted yet. Putting it all together, what's it complains that the ionosphere could not be parallel to Earth's surface or perpendicular to the field since it's curved. A flat earther asks him if the dome would have the same problem since it also would be curved. With this response is that the dome would be far enough above you that you could treat it as essentially flat. Why do you have to straw man everything I say? I don't know. It, what's, what is it? It's like Hitchens razor. Do not attribute malice to that which can be adequately explained with the confidence. I don't know if he doesn't understand my argument or if it's intentional but with this response that the dome would be far enough blah blah blah, this is now one of my favorite arguments from a flat earther he also suggests that there could be a flat layer of plasma below the curved dome that would act as a gaussian surface apparently real scientists would have to prove that the ionosphere could act like a gaussian surface but it's perfectly fine for him to assume not only this the that some other layer of plasma could do this but that such a layer exists to begin and is flat okay now of course what i'm actually saying is that there does appear to be potentially vertical layers of plasma that could turn to some type of solidity and I've actually specifically say super solid um, and that that would be uh, it would be parallel to a sur- to a surface below it even if the overall containment was a dome and as as to what I actually said about the dome I didn't say it would be so high up you could treat it like it's flat I said no like it, it could actually be lower right and it just comes up from the surfaces and just goes across the earth parallel to the surface and then curves back down at the edges it would drop off at the edges and that's where you would actually have to test it um, where were we at? Oh yeah, okay, so and apparently real scientists have to prove the ionosphere. And actually, my point is that within the globe model, the ionosphere that they claim, he tactically left this out, of course, they claim that it constantly changes. The reason they do that is because radio waves change how far they go, and they change what frequencies go a certain distance. If you're claiming they're bouncing off of an ionosphere, well, they actually fluctuate the height at which that ionosphere supposedly is. They'll say it's at 30 miles, okay? It was at 50 miles this time to explain the radio wave propagations. You have to do that within the globe paradigm. So like I said earlier, if you were to believe that, that that's gonna actually change the amount of volume between the ionosphere and the surface, right? If it's at 30 miles, you have a certain amount of volume. If you then pop it up to 45 miles now there's a different amount of volume and in fact they say that this moves up and down all over the atmosphere meaning it doesn't all move up uniformly to change the volume together so you would have dr- gross differences in the ver- in the electric field all over the earth and they would change constantly you would not have consistent uniformity of a vertical electric field that is the actual argument against the globe earth ionosphere apparently real scientists okay we read that ironically what's it believes that all of this is a great argument against the globe when in fact it is probably one of the weakest arguments he has put forward okay so and this is the part that i did correct all that misinformation But what's even funnier than that is he's not addressing the linearity of the voltage gradient, which is the problem, right? You would have concentric circles if you had equipotential surfaces on, and if I'm going too fast, at me in the chat or whatever, let me know. But if you had a conductive surface or sphere, right, put that inside of an electric field, then you're going to have the strongest charge at the surface. It's going to get weaker as you get further away, and it's going to begin to exponentially fall off because the amount of volume that charge is spreading throughout or distributing throughout is increasing, right? You would have concentric circles coming out from the sphere, and it would be a radial distribution. You could not have a uniform vertical electric field with a linear voltage gradient unless you had two parallel plates with a finite volume, right? It's the linearity and the uniformity that specifically and explicitly refutes the claim of sphericity 
And so hopefully this guy will write a follow-up and actually address the questions that I have put on today. And let me, I know I'm talking a lot, and then I'll open back up, but let me go back to the two questions. Bang. Why does the electric voltage gradient increase away from the surface of the Earth when it should decrease? And why is the electric voltage gradient on the Earth linear? So those are the two questions. So I, I kind of knew where that was going, by the way, because I heard the alleged rebuttals and it was just that the Gaussian server is just a mathematical concept. And I'm like, no, but if we're going to talk about real life, like reality, physical reality, right? Well, over here in plain earth land, I can take an actual physical metal plate, one that's parallel to that, create an actual voltage gradient, and I can flip the polarity of the field and make things float, even when they're more dense or heavier than the air, right? So we can replicate what we see on the earth with two actual physical plates. Whether or not you can do something mathematically doesn't mean anything. We're talking about what's actually going on in physical reality, and there has to be a physical cause of our electric field we see in physical reality, right? The ability to do something mathematically doesn't change that. And I actually pointed out to the CERN physicists as well, I'm like, can you actually demonstrate for me physically at any scale um, a vertical electric field that has uniform distribution and linearity within a lab using a sphere? And he ended up conceding that you cannot do that, that it will always be radial distribution, um, then got kind of triggered and left. And so this is a guy that, that taught it or whatever. Um, so I'm still kind of waiting on the answer to be honest. And, and Richard Feynman straight up tells you that the, the uh, the discovery was incredibly unexpected. So then people began to theorize about cosmic rays, etc. Even though that still doesn't answer it. So I know that was a lot, but hopefully I addressed that. If there's another part of it that you think I didn't address, let me know. I think I literally read every part of it, though. So that's yeah, rough. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you, I still don't understand the, the visual in my head of radial versus linear. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let me, sh can you see that you can see the PowerPoint, right? You kind of wrote by that. I think he dropped, but probably by mistake. Yeah, maybe he'll come back, but I'll show, I'll show it anyway. Like, uh, like I showed earlier, this would be radial distribution, right? So, pop that up. So you have the Earth here being this interior circle, and you're going to have concentric circles coming out from that. So as the charge, you see the charge going up to the quote unquote ionosphere here, right? As it comes up, it's going to spread out because because the area it has to spread out gets wider and wider the further away from the surface it gets. Now, if you have, sorry, let me make sure that they can see it. If you have two plates like this, right? Well, there's a finite volume. There's the same amount of volume over here as there is over here. Doesn't matter where you go, right? There's the same distance between the bottom plate and the top plate, but on a sphere, it's different, right? It gets wider as you go up. So what's gonna happen? Well, you have a certain amount of charge. Now you have more space, more volume, right? So it's going, the amount of charge is gonna drop off exponentially away from the sphere because you have more space to spread out in all directions. So it will be radial as opposed to linear, which would be like this right here. This would be linear, this would be radial. And of course on a sphere, it has to be radial. And so if we live on a sphere electric field, it would have to be radial. And I've heard people try to claim, well, if you just take a small segment of the Earth and you're real close to the surface, then it would look pretty much the same. That isn't even entirely true, but if you're really close to the surface, it could give you the illusion, right, that it was equipotential. But uh, not 50 miles up, right, not even a few miles up, and certainly not many miles apart from each other, so. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, yep. Hey, so my question is kind of having to do with the surveyors and how they use that equipment, I forget what it's called, um, with the plumb lines. And they, you know, make those radial lines going out from the center of the earth, right? They look out uh, and look at things in the distance and they see, oh, because the plumb lines are have a very slight different angle out of each other, more uh, spreading out from the center of the earth, they would make the same argument about the charge, which is that on such small distances, the effect of something being radial would be almost identical to something being linear. Like if you wipe out a CD, clean a CD off, right? You're like wiping it radially so you don't scratch it. 
uh, out from the center. But if the CD was like, you know, the size of like, you know, a whole town or whatever, you'd be, it would just look like you're wiping straight lines up from the surface. But yeah, I just wonder if, if that's, if it's just such a scale problem where the scale is just so big that you wouldn't notice the difference between a radial and linear. And then later on, if you just want to address it later in the stream, I, I was uh, watching something you did last week about the angular size of the sun not changing with proper solar filters. I just wanted later if you could uh, address that. Sure, sure. Well, really quickly, I point out that if you have like a limit to how far you can see and the sun is outside of that, you're only going to see the sun from the same distance in all directions. The angular size is not expected to change. Certainly not much. Um, we can talk about that. That's kind of what I thought. Yeah. But like you can replicate this. I have a little dome over here. You take a light over top of it. It's going to stay the same size and it's going to arc over top of you even though it's staying the same height above you. But um, so yeah, that, that equal distant away from you will make the angular size remain the same. Um, so when it comes to the idea of like the plumb bobs, right? This is a good analogy actually to use it. So on an earth, flat earth, right? You drop a plumb bob and that's a vertical plumb line straight down to the earth. And we assume the Earth is perpendicular to the plumb bob, right? Um, so we assume the Earth is a plane. The globe model says, well, yeah, we do that because for intents and purposes, it's close enough. You can treat it like it's a plane on the small scale. Then if we say we go 10 miles out, we drop another plumb bob, right? Well, like on a flat Earth, those are parallel to each other. On a globe, they're slightly diverging out from each other, right? Because it's on a sphere. And yeah, like you, so they'll actually claim that they measure reciprocal zenith angles and then they'll point out that it's incredibly small, the measurements they're supposedly making, and that lateral refraction is, can affect it way more than that, and it doesn't actually match, and then they fluctuate it around, and blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's just, it's, a, it's ridiculous. But now imagine if you take those plumb bobs that are slightly diverging out, right? Which I think your point is that, well, it'd just be very slight, so you wouldn't really know the difference. Okay, well, keep going up from there. So go a mile up. Now how much are they diverted out? Okay, go three miles up. Go 10 miles up. Now they're diverging out quite a bit. The space between them is increasing a lot, which means the charge has a lot more space to distribute. So you would see a difference in the field. But what we know is you can actually put a hot air balloon up 30 miles and it's the same. You can go to the top of a mountain and it's the same. It should be different though. So yes, at the surface, uh -huh. like I said, you can say it would be kind of the same, right? But as it gets further away from the surface, it would change. I didn't know that they had uh, done measurements about that. Uh, that was sort of my question was, you know, hot air balloons, altitude changes, uh, stuff like that. You know, obviously the divergence of charge spreading out like it would naturally do would, um, would have a lot to do with that. Uh, so that's a good, um, is there any, is there any, uh, Thing I can take a look at about uh, measurements of different altitudes of charge like that, or uh... yeah, I'll find it. I'll find it. But they use what's called an electrometer, and they put them on hot air balloons. They also use voltmeters at different elevations. But I'll find something about the electrometer on the balloons. But that's kind of what. Um, let me see. That's what Feynman's talking about here. Let me hide the Thanks. PowerPoint. So he's talking about here, he says, um, to test this theory, some physicists carried an experiment up in balloons to measure the ionization of the air and discovered that the opposite was true. The ionization per unit volume increased with altitude. So again, if you look here, the prediction of the globe is that it should decrease away from the surface. But what they found the opposite, they found that it actually increased, right? And so it says here that, that um, the two plates char were charged periodically to the potential V. Due to the conducti conductivity of the air, the plates slowly discharged. The rate of discharge was measured with the electrometer, right? And here's a depiction of it, very similar to the setup of a capacitor, right? You have two parallel plates. Um, so yeah, they put an electrometer on a hot air balloon and they watched the, vo the uh, ionization per unit volume increase with altitude, which was not expected. Um, and they started coming up with different theories to try to explain why it actually increased away from the surface. Uh, so yeah, I'll show you. It, so the 100 volts per meter is like a consistent relationship, really high in the sky. And you know, some people may claim it changes when you get to space, Well, it's like, what are you talking about, right? You're talking about your right. vacuum where there's basically nothing there and we can't verify it ourselves. So like, you know, the reality that we see is you can test whether or not it's a sphere even at like 20 miles. You just put out air. Well, I think one of the uh, things that my people might struggle with is is people don't know a lot about electricity and you know just even in general household stuff. So if you think of like water pressure, like if you shot water out 
you know, or you had like a flat system and there was water pressure up and down. Well, if you had it spreading out, you know, the water pressure would, would go way down the higher you go up because the water has more space to have to occupy. And that's what you're saying. What it would be in a spherical or a circular system is that as everything goes up, and not only is going up, it's having to account for all this more space it's entered per Correct. square foot or per, or per linear foot or whatever. So the fact that it's not measured as that is, um, yeah, is, 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 is the, the, the crux of the whole thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It has more left to right space to spread out. So it wouldn't, re it wouldn't remain linear. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let me check the donations. Thank you. And then yeah. I don't know if you ever checked out the, uh, there's a, Similar to, similar to uh, Mickelson Morley, there was a 1980, 86, 89 uh, experiment called the Silver Tooth experiment, having to do with interferometry, and uh, that's another very interesting um, case study of, of uh, interferometry and the search for the uh, for the ether. I've never heard of it. The Silver Tooth. Yes, they call it the Silver Tooth experiment. I think it was. I want to say nineteen eighty six, but it might be nineteen eighty nine. I don't. I don't remember. Nice. I'll check it out, man. Maybe Alan's heard of it. I've never heard of it. All right. Let me check these out here. Can't wait for Miss Switch to launch so we can have all this info in our pocket. Um, technically, it is launched. We haven't. Uh, so you can build a lot of it up, but you have to choose to make it public. A lot of it hasn't been made public yet, but it is technically there. That's members.misswits.com. I'm trying to get everyone pulled over. Um, it's been trickier than I thought, but. Yeah, we will have like an entire source of information there for sure. Think of it, ten dollars, Luke, and everyone. Just make sure you check your emails that you signed up with. All right, Jason Blocker, what do you reckon the smallest particle of matter is? Although everything is ultimately energy, things there are things that manifest in physical forms. Do you believe in molecules, atoms? I'm curious because I have no idea myself, and I trust your opinion. Uh, that's a good question, man. I mean, I think that. The concept of molecules is interesting, right? Like it, it does seem to be a pretty reliable conceptualization of what we call matter. When you get down to atoms, I don't buy it at all, right? Like the atom is claimed to be 99.9999999% empty space. And of course you have the Bohr model and it, that was change has been changed like five times from like basically a mini solar system model and all of it keeps being disproven so the idea that there's like a physical atom of material that's 99.99999 percent empty space like literally five nines um is wild to me and i don't believe it and it takes a geometry of a torus field and so you're getting into an energetic manifestation when you get down to what people call atoms and of course you'll see that they uh they have a, a vortex with a torus field so um, yeah, that would be my answer. Thank you for the super chat, Jason Blocker. And then Jesus is king. Love all the work you do, brother. May the creator give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for the $25 tip and the kind words. Greatly appreciated it. Jesus is king. Thank you, man. Uh, yeah, I, tr I trust the creator, man. He's got my back. Um, Actually, let me take this time real quick, and then everyone else that wants to pop up, you can raise your hand, or if you, if anyone else wants to try to actually answer the questions here. And again, the questions are, why does the uh, electric voltage gradient increase away from the surface of the Earth? And why is the voltage gradient of the Earth linear? Um, but I do wanna, let me come onto the screen real fast. I'll do it for Discord as well. All right. Um, I want to give you guys a bit of an update. So I did go to NASA twice. So I went there and then I decided to get a hotel. So I paid for a hotel and I stayed overnight because I was able to talk to a different astronaut the next day. I wanted to go to the lunch with him, but it wasn't available, but I do plan on doing that in the future. Long story short, I did have an interaction with two different astronauts. Um, so I got my glasses, I got the tickets, I got my annual pass. Drove there about three hours, got a hotel, um, and I did stream it for the Misfits, even though we had a bit of an issue on the first day, and then I do have it documented but not publicly releasing it yet. It was very interesting to say the least. I will, all right, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna um, show one thing real fast, just so, cause I don't want people to, I don't wanna leave them hanging with that. 
So I'm gonna play this real quick and hopefully everyone will be patient with me, but I want to give you guys a bit of a heads up for one one of the things. So many of the things I'm not going to reveal yet for obvious reasons. If you're a miswit and you're vetted and you're trusted and you're known, um, then we could go from there. But I do have it documented, but I'm trying to compile it. Uh, let's just say the astronauts are messing up on their stories a lot, which seems weird, right? Because I thought they've been to space. That seems weird to me. Like, if you ask me what happened in my high school playoff game, I know what happened because I did it, right? <laughs> so, I don't know, man. Um, so, stay tuned for that. It should be very interesting. I want to play this to give you one example of where they messed up. And then we're going to open it back up. Will. Yeah. Okay. So, keep in mind, pay attention to what they say here, and then I'll tell you what the astronaut said to me. And it's just wild. So let me change it for Discord. Tick, bang. All right, let's watch it. Whilst from in Mark space. Mark Cameron. This is from Mark Cameron. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see yeah, because yeah. you can see the stars. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and, and I know I pointed this out on NASA for but like, why is Don Pettit stare at him intently, waiting for his answer? Like he doesn't know the answer, and he's waiting to know what he says. I thought you both been to space like that, like hundreds of times or something, like hundreds of hours. Watch this guy like turn and look, like what's the answer? And then as soon as he answers, he's like, yeah, yeah. It's like they're doing improv or something, but. All right, I won't interrupt again, but just pay attention to Don Pettit's body language. How how incredibly sus this is. Whilst, in, whilst in from Mark space, Cameron. This is from Mark Cameron. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see yeah, because yeah, you can see the stars. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah, the stars. Yeah. It's it's not a black a cool void. Thing. I mean, it's black, but there's all kinds of little polka dots. There's all the there's all the stars there, and the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. Yeah, you can, and there's more than stars. You can see planets. You can right. see moons. Uh, so he said you can see it pretty much all the time, and the cool thing about it is you can see it during the day. Okay. Moons. You you see the ga the gas. Uh, Magellan clouds of the yeah, Milky yeah, Way galaxy. Yeah, you see the Magellanic clouds. Magellanic. See, I was yeah. I just wanted the Magellan clouds. Well, there's a large clouds. one and a want small one, right? Yeah. And and then you can see uh, the zodiacal lights. Whoa. Uh, those those are amazing. Right before the lights sunlight. of the zodiac. The lights of the zodiac. The z zodiacal Whoa. lights. But one thing to add to this, I think, which is kind of interesting about being able to look into the black void, is that we can't do that when the sun is out here on Earth, and it's not because the sun is so bright. It's because this atmosphere, atmosphere yeah. right? The light comes through the atmosphere and refracts, it's and we scatters. see blue. It's scattered. Yeah, we see it blue. Scatters. So what we see is when you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the star? Okay. First of all, what does he mean by when he's here on Earth? I guess they're they're. This is a green screen behind them. They're on the Earth. But anyway, um, I won't go any further than that. But let's just say I talked to an astronaut, of course, face to face, and I asked her that very question. I asked her, "Can you see stars?" during the day on the side of the earth that is the sun where the sun is and if you don't know they supposedly go around the earth every 90 minutes so you would have 45 minutes every 45 minutes of seeing the stars where the sun is and i'm like can you see the stars during the day on the side of the sun and she said no you cannot see them and then she gave me the same script that the other astronaut did randomly wanted to tell me the talking point of well they look a lot like they do on the earth uh, they look exactly the same because we're not much closer. The only difference is that they don't twinkle because there is no atmosphere. Little she know, of course, that's that's a problem because the reason you would be able to see the stars in space even during the day is because there is no atmosphere. They always want to tell you that talking point, though. Both of them force that in there. And I'm like, okay, but just to clarify, like you can't see the stars during the day on the side of the sun. She said, nope. And you hear these people who claim to have been on the same space station in the same area of space, in the same space, claiming that you absolutely do see them all the time, even during the day. And the reason that you do see the stars during the day is because 
there is no atmosphere. So pretty interesting, I would say. There's one piece, just one example, and of course something else that they say that they look exactly the same as they do on the Earth. Then you have another astronaut say, uh, "You, have you ever seen? I'm from Colorado. Have you ever seen the stars in Colorado? When you get away from light po- uh, pollution, you see tons of stars. Imagine that times a thousand when you're in space. So they say specifically, you see way more stars, and it doesn't look the same as it does on Earth." So we're getting contradictory statements from people who claim to go to space with our tax money. Seems pretty weird to me, but anyway, we have much um, bigger home runs that came from the trip. So I wanted to give you guys a head up, heads up. Okay, and then one more thing I will also announce actually while I'm at it. Um, I am going to be, I think I'm officially going to be on Sam Tripoli's podcast, the Tinfoil Hat podcast. A lot of people have asked me to get on there and ask when I'm going to do it, blah, blah, blah. I do think that I will be on there soon, next month, I believe. It should be finalized soon. I just have to, of course, get the money to fly out there both ways, get a hotel and a rental car, blah, blah, blah. But there you go, there's the announcement. I should be on Sam Tripoli's podcast next month. Should be very exciting, so I think that is official. Okay, so we'll go back to the room if anyone has anything else they want to talk about and whether you're a glober or flat earth if anyone has any input on well i'm sharing discord with you guys any input on the questions that we have here because as far as i can tell uh, you know according to my simple mind this refutes the globe what's up brother you were trying to talk you're you're breaking up yeah, maybe try to reconnect and, and mess with your mic or something. You're breaking up. Uh, Angel, Angelin, were you trying to say something? Okay, very anticlimactic here. Okay, I'm going to mute you. All right, anyway, um, either either uh, globe, earth, or flat earth, or whatever, just a reminder of the questions here. Why does the electric voltage gradient increase away from the surface of the earth, and why is the electric voltage gradient on the earth linear? These are both major problems for the sphere. It's actually a direct physical refutation of the sphere. You would not have a linear voltage gradient. And of course, let's also, I guess until someone jumps in, jump in anytime someone wants to say something. If you want to jump on the stage, raise your hand. If you want to jump in from the YouTube or Rumble or Rockfin, uh, click the link in the description and then we'll bring you up. All you have to do is raise your hand, you get brought up. Someone trying to say something? Okay, real quick, I want to answer a couple of the thing. GF6, you trying to say something? Yeah, yeah, uh, got a couple of questions about the linearity point mm-hmm. and the uniformity. So it varies a lot, right? So the, the voltage gradient can vary any, anywhere between 90 and a couple of hundred volts per meter, depending on weather uh, mm-hmm. and location and terrain. Um, h- how far up is it linear? Well, it doesn't change based on terrain. Where did you get that? Gradient, Will. Yeah. Well, in, only only direct about it in his document there. Directly by the surface, sure. It's just like standing on the surface, so like a mountain or something. The electric field will go around that, but as soon as you start to increase away from the surface, it's going to be a hundred volts per meter. Would it? Would it? The uniformity is not about the fact that it doesn't change, right? So like, yeah, like uh, weather can make the field change, right? But the actual, yeah. yeah, but the actual original field itself has a uniform distribution. It's a hundred volts per meter, and it's linear. So yeah, it fluctuates within it, it, weather. Good. The linearity, right? Where, where is the uh, in your stuff? You haven't really shown us that, like a, a graph of the, the the voltage with altitude or anything like that, and how far the linearity extends for. So Feynman was talking about the the uh, amount of ionization increasing as we go up, um, but he didn't really talk too much about the actual voltage gradient. He did uh, as we go up. He other did. Than, he did 100 volts per meter. So, like, the official narrative of the globe is that it's like that up to, like, 50 miles. Yep. So, we wouldn't expect to see much linearity change because of a sphere, then. That's only 100 miles in 3,000. So, it's only going to be a fraction of a percent. It um, isn't and cool. within the variability of the gradient, we wouldn't expect to see... We wouldn't be able to detect any difference between a, a parallel plates or a um, spherical charge surface. That's not correct. It's not about percentage. 
It's about actual volume itself. Like the percentage of the radius doesn't matter. It's the amount of charge mm-hmm. and then the amount of space the charge has. You increase an, yeah, a, yeah. a significant amount of charge left to right with a radial distribution on a sphere. So the percentage of the radius is not relevant. It is because the, the so it's basically you're talking about the surface area of the sphere, right? So your Gaussian surface that you're looking at. That so if you if you were to cover a ga- the the surface of the Earth with a Gaussian s- surface that was also a sphere, for ease of analysis, and you did one at each meter, that as those spheres go out, they get bigger in surface area, or in portion to radius squared. So that's the rate you would expect the potential to drop off, and over. From, from the surface potential to the potential at 100 kilometres, we're dealing with 100 in 3,000 change in the radius. So there's only going to be 100 in 3,000 change in the electrical potential because of that. So it's very small, and that's, you wouldn't be able to detect that from other normal variability in the, the, um, the, the electric field that's present anyway. That is not correct, right? So for one, uh, we do not see a distribution of charge relative to a radius, which is specifically what Coulomb's law on a sphere would dictate. We do not see that. You're say, you're basically saying that you're not going to be able to tell the difference, but you absolutely are. We can actually measure the causes of the change in the electric field, right? Like thunderstorm activity, lightning storm activity, et cetera. Secondly, yeah. it's not, it's, it sounds good to say, oh, but like 50 miles is just a small percentage of the radius. But that doesn't matter. The fact is that it would change because as you get further away from the surface, there's more area. So it would actually just be a relationship between the yeah. increase in volume and the amount of charge. It isn't like, oh, it wouldn't be much because it's a small portion of the R value. The R value just gives you the initial amount of charge that you would have, mm-hmm. right? And then it's going to distribute regularly after that. And it doesn't do that. Admittedly, mm-hmm. it doesn't do that. I don't even know. I've never heard of actual explanation. What's up? Yeah. yeah, I think if you actually did it mathematically, you, you, it'd, it'd show. You know, I should do it. Um, but the the difference in in um, you know the rate of change of potential of a of a if, if the Earth was a perfect sphere with a perfectly distributed charge uh, in a vacuum with no atmosphere, so you had a, you know there, there was no conductivity in the atmosphere changing the charge distribution. But the electric field, the difference in that electric field strength between the earth and 50 kilometers is, is going to be small no it's in not to the, to the radius wait do you, do you agree it's going to begin to drop off exponentially not exponentially it'll drop off with a square with a, with a surface area so with r squared basically it's an r squared relationship uh are you sure i think so it's cubed is it not uh yeah if you're going for a sphere it'll be well, that's what you're that's what yeah cubes. that's what you guys claim we live on so it's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. i was just thinking about the the cross-sectional shape it's a circle which, well that yeah. okay yeah so, so it's like it's mm. it's convenient from a globularist position right to say well we'll treat it like it's flat in small sections but that has implications over the course of the entire earth you're going to have an exponential drop off the further away you get from the surface it's going to drop off it's at not a exponential. Sig- well, it's a significant rate, significant rate, and it increases proportionate to distance away from the surface. So it, it there's a radial distribution. You have concentric circles, and it would not in any way remain linear nor uniform. The fluctuations from uniformity because of external variables doesn't rebut the uniformity. And then you just baselessly claim that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference if it was linear or not. That is not true. We use electrometers on hot air balloons. We know that there is a linear distribution all the way up as far as we can access. And then believe it or not, I'm not going to believe that like, you know, NASA is going to tell me what happens above that. So you would be able to yeah, tell. But it, it's, there's only going to be a 5% drop at 100 kilometers in terms of the... Um, electric field strength I don't believe that that's cor- I don't believe that that's correct right and regardless of the percentage you would see there's no uniformity or linearity but it is linear so there's no uniformity or linearity in the atmosphere it's highly variable it absolutely is linear the amount of that's not 
approximately linear, but it's not precisely linear. It's not like your experiment where you had a very precise and uniform voltage. Things like so, anytime you have a a, um, a conductor in an electric field, um, you will get a change in the shape of the electric field. So the Earth's electric field is full of moisture. It's full of charged particles. The currents are flowing, and um, which is something that is not happening between in a capacitor. There's no current flowing between the plates. You've just got charge stored. So you've got all of these things, electrical things, moving around in the Earth's electric field. The field is not uniform. I just addressed that. You can bro. say it's uniform on average. I just addressed that, right? And we can actually isolate the input that varies it from uniformity. You can measure it, right? So, like, the field itself, if you didn't introduce external variables, it's a uniform linear distribution. And then say we have, like, a lightning storm pop up. Well, the field in that local region will change. And then what happens whenever the, the lightning storm resides? It goes back to its uniform field. It's measurable. We've done this many times yeah. all over the world at different altitudes and different distances away from each other and it remains linear it matches exactly what you would see with uh external variability within a finite volume of two parallel plates well i'm happy to be corrected on that but if you could provide some specific references showing the um the uniformity of the field with altitude over time that would be really good sure, so we know yeah. there's thunderstorms and electrical activity but the evidence is that it's variable uh, and highly variable. And um, yeah, you can say on average it's 40,000, no, 400,000 volts, isn't it? Up to the ionosphere, something like that. It's very high voltage, but the average is only an average and it's not particularly distant. Okay. We can accurately predict the amount of voltage based on a linear distribution that's uniform at altitude. So I can say, okay, you're about to go up 20 miles. This is what the voltage potential is going to be there. And you can go up there and without like external variability, meaning there's a storm or whatever, right? You're going to see that the voltage matches the prediction of a linear distribution, not a radial distribution. That's what we see in reality. That's what we see. And in fact, it yeah. also increases from the surface. So why does the voltage, the, do, you, do you agree that voltage potential decreases away from the surface of like a conducting sphere? Uh, like the potential a, does increase away from a sphere, yes. Uh, decrease, sorry. Uh, right, um, like the, if the I have a balloon and, lower, I yeah. and yeah, I rub it on my head, yeah. it's gonna be the strongest of the surface. So why does the, why does the voltage gradient increase away from well, I haven't seen anything talking about the increasing gradient. I've seen information about increasing amounts of ionization, but not increasing gradient. The potential um, increases yeah, so 100 volts per meter. Oh, yeah, the, the gradient is 100 volts per meter. So the An potential increase increases. in potential. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the potential is increasing. The gradient isn't. What? The gradient is a description of the change in potential. Gradient is change in delta potential. Yes. Right. That's right. it. But the actual potential, right, it, it is increasing at a relatively linear rate. The, the rate of change of potential isn't increasing. Did you see where it, did you actually read Feynman's paper where they talk about this specifically, right? They talk about how they, they put an electrometer on a balloon and went up yeah. and it increased surprisingly and it shocked everyone. What, what is the electrometer measuring? The potential. No, well, it's, it's measuring the amount of ionization in the, in the air. It's measuring how many charged particles are in the air. You realize that has a direct so, relationship with potential, right? No, it doesn't. What? Charge particles. <laughs> charge part so charge particles create potential, but they uh, are not the two aren't real, directly related like that. So What? They that the that instrument applies a charge to plates and the rate of discharge of the plates depends on how many charge particles are flowing through, allowing current to flow. So it measures how much ionization is in the atmosphere. 
Don't measure okay, where do you where do you get ionization yeah. from? Well, that's the question, right? And he's no, it's talking simple. about cosmic cosmic radiation, all, all that kind of stuff that causes ionization of particles in the atmosphere. The ionization is not caused by the electrical potential of the atmosphere, unless it's extreme, causing voltage what? breakdown. So you think that the potential increases from the surface and ionization increases from the surface and they're unrelated. Yeah, I think so. The, <laughs> no, the, the, brother, the ionization, no. yeah, the ion, because the potential gradient, right, is not necessarily causing the ionization. 100 volts per meter is not enough to cause ionization of air. You need thousands of volts per meter to make air ionized, like in lightning, right? It's You've got 20,000 volts per kilometer or something like that with ionization of air. Okay, wait up. Let me read the exact values here. We have, uh, let's see. Wait up. We have, uh, sorry, I'll find it. We have 700 megawatts and 400,000 volts coming yep. down at any point. Yeah, so 400,000 volts is the potential to the top of the ionosphere, right? 50 kilometers. Yeah, roughly. I mean, your, your system fluctuates. Yeah, yeah, across the surface, yeah, with about 1,800 amps yeah. flowing. And that's assuming, that's assuming an yeah. R value, of course. That's assuming the dimensions, but nevertheless. Yeah, yeah, but you could also... Go ahead. Yeah, but so you could also do that for some finite chunk of the Earth, right? You could you could work out what the potential is, what the conductivity is, how much power is being delivered through that electric field. Okay, so to still man your position, the electric voltage gradient increases away from the surface, as does measurable ionization but they are unrelated, the radial distribution would not be distinguishable from a linear distribution with parallel plates. And because there are fluctuations based on external variables such as weather, you can't actually determine if there is a uniformity to the field. That's a still man, right? Yeah, so there's no uniformity to the field. It's highly variable. The amount of ionization is not dependent on the gradient. And the gradient, uh, I'm still to see evidence of the gradient being highly non-linear. Oh, sorry, it's been, been highly, um, let me start again. Yeah, it's just still looking for strong evidence of the uniformity of the gradient. The evidence is the actual measurements measurements of the voltage gradient, bro. It's 100 volts per meter. There's slight fluctuations in the presence of weather, right? And there's an increase away from the surface. And if we're on a sphere in a vacuum, we're going to have a radial distribution that drops off away from the surface, right? And prior to any external variables, we're going to have a consistent decrease away from the surface. We do not observe this. And in fact, we have less and less of a medium the higher we go up, yet we have an increase in the voltage gradient. We do not see a consistent drop-off in proportion to an assumed radius value based on Coulomb's law, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm still, still looking for that evidence of the voltage gradient, not the ionization levels. That the voltage gradient increases with altitude? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, I, I, I haven't seen any evidence of that yet. Okay, but if it does, it. I'll, I'll give you the evidence, but you agree that if it does, that is not a radial distribution away from a sphere, which would predict that it would drop off and that it would be radial. Oh, yeah, you, you predict a, a 2 or 3% drop over 100 kilometers on a sphere that's a radius of 3,000 kilometers. So there would be some reduction, but yeah, to, to see that linearity all the way to whatever altitude has been measured to, that would be really good. 
Okay, but uh, just to clarify, you agree that if there is a uniform linear distribution away from the surface where there's an increase in voltage potential, that that would not match the predictions of a sphere inside of an electric field with radial distribution? Uh, it depends how far you're measuring up, right? So, so I don't think there'd be any noticeable difference at, at up to, say, 100 kilometres in the linearity of a field. You wouldn't be able to pick it from um, something that was generated from parallel plates versus a, a point charge or a sphere. Why would you not be able to tell a difference when it would be gradually decreasing away from the surface? Yeah, because the, the gradual decrease is lost in the noise, basically. And we can't average it. There's so much. Well, you can average it, but then you don't know whether it's linear or not. So, as I'm saying, so you mean it, ev- we can, though, because we can predict it at different altitudes. Like, this is what always happens with the globe Earth. The model becomes so unfalsifiable. Yes, yes. So, the model always becomes unfalsifiable. Simply based on distance away from the surface with a known average of 100 volts per meter. And it's accurate. Okay. It's accurate. We can go to a specific mountain and we can know what the voltage gradient is going to be there. And we can see fluctuations away from that. And as things calm down, it goes back to the predicted value or right at it. Right. But like on a sphere, the prediction is specifically different. It's a radial distribution. On a mountain, you're, it's even going to be less, right? It's going to be a fraction of percent off linear that, that you're not even going to be able to pick a linear, uh, any difference from a linear gradient on a mountain. Well, no, it's yeah. not good evidence that you're on a sphere. No, no but you, you can stick a voltmeter out off the mountain, right? The, the better measurements are certainly balloons, though, to use a balloon. Because as soon as you come off the surface, it's going to begin to level out the voltage gradient. It's just like with what happens is right off yeah. the surface, it all bunches up, right? It all bunches yeah, yeah, up. Because but then, the but then it goes right back. To, yeah, but then yeah. it goes right back yeah. to where the surrounding area is. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. So we have a vertical electric field on the earth with a downward electric current. We have equipotential surfaces that are parallel to each other, right? We have a vertical voltage gradient that increases away from the surface. All of these are exactly what you would have and predict if you had two parallel plates that were horizontal. It's exactly what you have, right? No, parallel plates that were perpendic- were exactly parallel, the voltage gradient would be perfectly uniform. It wouldn't increase. We no, that's not true. If we had the parallel plates, first, wh- what do you mean, bro? If, first of all, if we had two so parallel plates, between two pl- parallel plates, the electric field is uniform. That the electric field runs directly from plate to plate. The equal, the potential lines in those fields are perfectly uniformly spaced. It does, and it would increase away from the surface. The potential would increase, and the, the so potential now, increases, but the rate is linear, perfectly linear. Okay, so now if we add two parallel plates, and then we occasionally introduce like additional charge, right, like a like a thunderstorm, like a lightning storm, mm-hmm. right? Then it would slightly change in that isolated area, and then whenever that external yes. introduction resided, it would go back to its general uniformity and linearity. Yeah. So, so basically, this is what always happens. You're telling me that it's not happens. linear with altitude. No, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you it is. You said it increases with altitude, didn't you? As in, like, yeah, the potential continually increases because there's an equipotential potential. The potential increase. increases or the rate of potential? The potential. Volt per meter or the actual total potential? The total potential. Yeah, total potential. So that'll be the same in both cases. It will not be the same in both cases. It is linear or radial distinctly different like can you replicate what you're saying in a lab can you create a conduct can you have a conductive surface put it within an electric field and show that there's going to be um uniformity because you're claiming there's no uniformity but there is it's widely accepted that there is uniformity that's why your model Mm -hmm. invokes the ionosphere right and then it invokes cosmic rays to explain it increasing from the surface and then admittedly we don't fully understand the electric field within the globe paradigm but like what I'm asking is, can you go to a lab, can you take a sphere, and can you replicate the electric field that we see on the Earth? So you can take a sphere, you, you, you can replicate an electrical field that will 
corresponds to the theoretical field. So, you know, as you've said, it's a radial radial field with concentric lines of equipotential. The if you were to measure that with a change in radius of one percent, you would say that it would be linear. You wouldn't be able to measure you wouldn't be able to detect that it wasn't a linear change. Well, yeah, if you do it, it in a really small like scale. Yeah, if you do it in a really small scale where you just have like basically no room at all above the sphere. But if you do it in real life Yeah, but you do it in do it in real life where that, oh. that equates to Yes, where that equates to dozens of miles and thousands of yeah. miles left and right, because you don't have horizontal, then you would absolutely see a difference. You would have a huge change in the drop off of the charge. It would distribute radially. And why so would it increase away graph. from the surface? Your your model requires yeah. invoking cosmic so, rays. Do you get so what that? does yours increase away from the surface? Because there's a positive plate above us. Why would it not? Of course it would. You, the potential increases. The, in both cases, the potential increases away from the surface. It's expected to be that way with a positive plate above you. And of course, of course, I don't even dispute that there are there is energy coming from the sky. But the point is, like, let's just read what Feynman says here, right? Because obviously, it was not expected, right? We agree with that. It was an unexpected result. Which yeah, means that was that they saw the charge, <laughs> the amount of ionization increasing in the atmosphere. It was unexpected. Yeah. Why? Uh, they didn't know about the ionization in the upper atmosphere back then. But why? Why was it unexpected? Because the prediction would be that it wouldn't do that. That's why, right? So that's why I explained right here. So you know? What's up? That you don't confuse ionization with electrical potential. Two you're, different things. Yeah, yeah, but you're acting like they're completely unrelated. They are not. <laughs> if you have more potential, then you have you can have more ionization. Obviously. Yeah. Right. Okay. So they're directly related. But then you get more so moving like, charge, right? So if you've got a high potential and lots of ionization, you get a large current flow because those ionized particles will move in the electric field. But earlier they weren't related, so I'm glad we agree that they're directly related. No, it's, it's the the electrical potential is not causing the ionization. Is what is what I'm saying. The, they're the directly electrical related. gradient is not causing. No, the electrical field. God, now at they're not altitude is not causing the ionization. Now they're not directly related again. Let's read this. Another thing that can be measured in addition to the potential gradient is the current in the atmosphere. The current density is small, about 10 micro microamps crosses each square meter parallel to the earth. The air is evidently not a perfect insulator, and because of this conductivity, a small current caused by the electric field we've just been describing passes from the sky down to the earth. Why does the atmosphere have conductivity here and there among the air molecules? There is an ion, a molecule of oxygen, say, which has acquired an extra electron or perhaps lost one. These ions do not stay as single molecules because of their electric field. They usually accumulate a few other molecules around them. Each ion becomes a little lump, which, along with other lumps, drifts in the field, moving slowly upward or downward, making the observed current. Where do the ions come from? It was first guessed that the ions were produced by the radioactivity of the Earth. It was known that the radiation from radioactive materials would make air conducting by ionizing, ionizing the air molecules. Particles from the B rays coming out of the atomic nuclei are moving so fast that they tear electrons from the atoms, leaving ions behind. This would imply, of course, that if we were to go to higher altitudes, we should find less ionization because the radioactivity is all in the dirt on the ground and the traces of radium, uranium, potassium, etc. And just even without the radioactive input, it's just like the prediction of a sphere. So to test this theory, some physicists carried an experiment up in balloons to measure the ionization of the air and discovered that the opposite was true. The ionization per unit volume increased with altitude. The apparatus, like figure 9-3, the two plates were charged periodically to the potential V. Due to the conductivity of the air, the plate slowly discharged. The rate of discharge was measured with the electrometer. This was a most mysterious result, the most dramatic finding in the entire history of atmospheric electricity. It was so dramatic, in fact, that it required a branching off an entirely new subject, cosmic rays. Atmospheric electricity itself remained less 
Dramatic ionization was evidently being produced by something from outside the Earth. The investigation of this source led to the discovery of the cosmic rays. We will not discuss the subject of cosmic rays now, except to say that they maintain a supply of ions. Meaning that simply assuming that the Earth is a sphere with radial distribution, you can't actually explain what we see when it comes to ionization, right? You agree we need an external source for the ionization. What I'm saying is you have a second charged actual physical plate, and it could certainly be charged by things from outside of that, right? I mean, certainly there could be energy that passes through that plate, that charges up that plate, etc. That would then pass down. And certainly the, the ionosphere behaves like a, a charge plate, you know, equal potential plate in some senses, because it's a distribution of charge. But the, the charge of the ion... So looking at the, um, the levels of ionization, right, that... If the electrical potential is um, gradient, is uniform all the way up, or should be uniform all the way up, according to you, then mm -hmm. the amount of ionization caused by the electrical field would be the same all the way up. There's no difference between 100 volts per meter of the surface of the Earth and 100 volts per meter at 40 kilometers altitude. So if that electric field is causing ionization, it should be the same. There's Everywhere. more electric potential, though, and it's and we have a charged plate. Mm -hmm. We have a charged plate. It, this is what I'm not understanding here, right? First of all, let's just use. Let's say the ionosphere is the second plate. It's serve like do you. Is that what you think? The ionosphere serves as the second Gaussian surface for the globe. Um, it's definitely a, a source of charge. Yeah, and would it would impact the overall electric field of the Earth? Okay. But how, so, go ahead. Well, go ahead. I was just going to ask real quick. Well, how do you know you're not, I mean, how are you not assuming that? Because the fact that it increases, does that not indicate that it has to be a physical, actual Gaussian surface for the fact that it increases? It's a, it's a, a region of, of higher charge density, right? So, so you're just, and, you're just so, but you're assuming that a non-physical surface could create that increase from the surface. Are you not? Yeah. All you need to create an electric field is an electric charge. You, can, you don't have to have a second surface at all or a second, you know, if you've got a, if the earth is negatively charged, you don't need a positive charge anywhere to create the electric field. Yeah, but we're talking about the fact that it increases from the surface. So do you, do you have any experimental validation that you can have that increase between two regions without two physical surfaces? That uh, to me, that kind of is what a lot of this is boiling down to, or at least part of it, the way I'm seeing uh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you, you can uh, a good example of this is your um, the Van de Graaff generator, right? That you have. It is a sphere. It gets charged up. If you were to um, measure the electrical potential between um, a, a probe and the sphere, you would be able to measure the 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 the, the you know the spherical drop off that you would expect to see. You don't need a second surface. You just need the sphere to be highly charged. Incorrect. The second surface is the plate on the meter. I build meters, by the way. I don't just use them. Yeah, I'm about to say, well, should we play a video explaining oh, how yeah, a capacitor you, works? Well, you're measuring measuring the field there, right? Yeah, so you need to have something to measure the field. You're but absolutely but you're, incorrect, and you should admit that you were incorrect. Can you explain what you were saying again then, please? The second plate is the meter itself. The meter itself it's is not acting. generating the electric field. No, the it's electric not. field exists without the meter being there. That's cor that's correct. But the measurement is able to be done by the meter because it's part of the circuit. And yes. It, it gets the reason why that drops off when you get farther away is because you don't have a solid condu conductor. Unlike the at the atmospheric uh, electricity experiments, the conductor is raised up, okay, with the balloon, and I think you're missing that point. Well, that's another thing altogether. Yeah. So, so we were talking about Feynman's balloon experiment. He was discussing. It wasn't his experiment, but measuring the ionization. Yeah. So, if you if you take your probe that you've built, have one end on the generator and one end in the air you'll measure a very specific drop in voltage with distance. 
Yeah, but this is increasing. That's the whole point. It's not decreasing. It's the voltage increasing. is increasing? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So electrical potential is proportional to the distance. Yeah, 100 volts per meter. So if at any point, if that was actualized and grounded, essentially this could get into potentially what you know how lightning is functioning. Like that, that voltage is becoming actualized, and then it's grounding, essentially shorting the circuit in that sense. But yeah, the 100 volts per meter that's increasing... The question is, can that increase without an actual physical barrier? Is there any way you could show that replicated without a physical barrier? Because the globe doesn't have that. You, could, you mean ionization? You could try to come up with ideas that there's some mm. kind of a barrier, but that would be theoretical and not able to be. Yeah, no. Unless you could show that replicated. Yeah, yeah. So, so and that's exactly what we're just discussing: the, the sphere, the charged Van de Graaff generator, with a high high charge on the surface, the voltage gradient. Going away from that is, um, as you would expect, and the voltage increases as you get further away. The potential difference between you and the charge is increasing. Wait, like, I, I guess what I, I feel like this is really kind of simple, too. It's like, if you want to replicate what we see on the Earth, you can easily do it in a lab with physical surfaces. You're claiming that we live on a sphere with radial distribution inside of a vacuum. Okay. Right, right. like they would have to have the two plates and then remove one of the plates and then come up with some other thing that could act as a plate, which is... No, you don't need a plate. Electrical fields don't need two plates. Do you have the field we have on the Earth? You absolutely do. That's why your model tries to claim it's the ionosphere, even in Feynman lectures, even in every university textbook ever that tries to explain the electric field. They invoke the ionosphere as the second surface. It's important, but you don't need to have one. A sphere, a, a charge sphere, or even a point charge by itself has an electric field and an electrical potential. But if you didn't you have a plate, think about what the charge no, would do. You don't need a plate. Yeah. Think oh, about yeah, what radial. the charge it's would radial. do oh. in an infinite vacuum. You get an infinite electric field. Okay. Your model invoked for the electric field we see on the Earth, which is actually measured to be a uniform vertical electric field with a linear electric potential gradient. <laughs> the voltage gradient is explained in your paradigm by invoking the ionosphere. That has major problems conceptually, <clears throat> even if you're granted the idea that it's actually there. Well, it constantly fluctuates within your paradigm. So you would be able to predict the actual change in the electric field and drastic changes in the electric field, right? Based on how far you could shoot radio waves that day. But then we don't see that at all. We don't see major fluctuations based on the alleged ionosphere's location, like its height, which supposedly fluctuates so what, dozens of miles. The evidence I've seen is that, that the 100 volts meter can vary between anywhere between 80 and 90 and 300 volts per meter. Yes, it, you it's, need it's, a direct it's, causal relationship between your assumed ionosphere and the amount that it changes. What we see in reality is that changes during like lightning storms, thunderstorms, right? And it's temporal. Even without that, just wind, wind is enough. Okay, but you need to show that it changes proportionate to the alleged increase of the height of the ionosphere, which in your model changes all the time, every minute. Let alone the uh, oblate spheroid claim. So is that is that ionosphere oblately spheroid? And then you've got that, those differences as well. Exactly. That's like a, is even uh, more oblately spheroid, right? But the same deal, right? It, the radius, if if the base radius of the spherical charge is 3,600 miles or whatever it is, and we move to 3,600 or 3,700 miles or go to your mountain, 3,610 miles, um, the difference between that and a perfectly perfect set of parallel plates is negligible, right? The, the linearity of the field there is very high. No, this, what you're not understanding is we're starting from the surface. That's what we're starting yeah. from. Okay. We have a certain amount yeah. of charge on the surface. Now it's starting to... Yeah, but it's already distributed, right? Well, in proportion it's... to the radius. So the field strength at the surface of the sphere is based on the radius that you're at already. So if you've got 
your, your initial radius of 3,600 miles and a charge distribution, you have a specific um, field strength at that point. If you go up another 10 miles, the charge is spreading out or the field is spreading out and the potential is increasing. But the rate that is increasing is proportional to the change in radius. Not That the, is the not what is radius. measured and observed, though. And what you're saying is, oh, it's well, it's so close. close. You would, yeah, see, it's pretty close. Yeah. I promise you wouldn't notice. Yeah, trust because me. Because your 100 meters is not pretty, is not linear either, right? There's no such thing as a perfect linear. But anyway, I've, I've got to run, guys. I'm actually meant to be at work, but it's been an interesting chat. Um, and I'm sure it won't be the last time we'll talk. All right, brother. Apologies thanks for being. No, nah, thanks for being cordial, man. Okay. Yep. I, mean, I just want to point out that still the problem remains, right? Like the the fact that the field constantly changes, we all know that that happens, right? Like, of course, there's weather, there's wind, there's all kinds of things. There's elevation differences, topographical differences, right? It constantly changes. Even with topographical differences, it just basically the field bunches up right above the surface, but then it starts to go back to its linearity. On a sphere, it is a consistent, predictable drop off based on the R value. It is a radial distribution fluctuations back and forth then it leveling back out around the general linearity is not the same thing as a consistent drop off radially those are different meaning if i go to the top if i send a hot air balloon i should know where what the voltage gradient should be in relationship to the altitude below it as it goes up and it may fluctuate some but there should be it should fluctuate from a base that's dropping off radially that is not what we observe. That is not even how, when you get into geoengineering patents and the technologies, they assume a linear relationship of the voltage gradient. That's how they measure it. That's how they utilize it, right? And then they monitor external variables that will change it. They do not say, oh, well, based on the R value, it should drop off this much, right? The radial distribution is completely ignored in reality. And so the globe will try to tell you stuff like, well, it's close enough, don't worry about it. Oh, well, if you just take a small section, it'll basically be linear. It'll look like it's linear or whatever. And now what we've seen now is pretty clearly the best defense is that it's like conflating the fluctuations in the field, the variability of the field with uh, a radial distribution. But see, radial is consistently changing from the surface of a sphere, right? As opposed to randomly fluctuating based on environmental conditions and then leveling back out to a linear distribution. So hopefully that makes sense. But one thing, uh, I know that Alan sent me this. I think it's probably a good thing to watch. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, if you guys are cool with it, it's like a five minute video and it explains how a capacitor works. And clearly what the evidence shows is that we live in a giant capacitor, right? Um, so I think maybe some people I'm seeing in the chat don't really um, understand that. So are you guys cool with playing this video real quick? Yep. All right, cool. Let me share the screen. Um, and I, I think the ionosphere causes serious problems for them to act like the ionosphere is the surface. It just, I don't know. It's just crazy because what it always ends up boiling down to is like something that can't be tested and just trust me. Trust yes, me. That's what I was, that's what I was going to say real quick is that every time they make a prediction and it's totally, totally wrong, they just make up a, something to explain it away that's unfalsifiable. It's the most annoying bullshit pseudoscience and they are so adamant that it's fucking science and it's not science. <laughs> It's anti-science. I agree. Just watch the weak words. Joe, what's up? Oh, sorry. Sorry. You're good. You're good. You're good. Well, I was just going to say on the oblate spheroid nature of it, wouldn't it be different? Wouldn't the entire gradient be different from the equator going up versus, let's say, 30 degrees latitude north or 40 degrees north? Wouldn't it be a, a, like literally a different type of gradient, a different, uh, a different distribution? Yes, it would. <laughs> Yeah, they're going to hide. They're, so we see clearly what they're trying to do is hide in inside the variability of the field, right? The fact that the field changes based on like weather, they're going to hide within that and be like, I promise it matches the sphere. You just can never tell. No, you're not going to be able to tell. And they're going to say the same should thing we, for that. Should we add this to the list of wobbles? <laughs> yeah, this is, wobble. yeah, bro. This is the electric field wobble. <laughs> The wobularity of the field to just fit whatever they needed to fit. Yeah, we should get paid to make the globe. All right, let's uh, 
Let's check out this video. It explains the basic understanding of a capacitor. And, and this, this is very interesting because this doubles as an explanation for gravity. Um, and when you look at the sheer amount of voltage and amps coming from the sky, creating this downward bias, and we have on the smallest scale, right, like, uh, like electrostatics being 10 to 36 power stronger than gravity is even claimed to be, everything fits right in snugly like a little perfect puzzle piece on a plain earth. Um, but anyway, let's watch this video. I think Discord should be able to see it. You guys let me know for sure that you can hear it because this is actually on X, but you should be able to hear it. Um, just let me know if you can't hear it, I guess. And then, there we go. go. From a physics viewpoint, the energy of a capacitor is stored in the metal plates and not directly in the dielectric. As we energize the wires by using a power source, such as this battery, notice that the two capacitor plates are accumulating charge. One is positive and one is negative. This creates an electrical imbalance between the two plates. Since the electron is a negatively charged particle, the negative plate is filling up with electrons. This leaves the positive plate in a position where it is continually giving up electrons. Now we can add a dielectric material in between these plates if we like, and that changes the electrical capacity that can be stored. I'm not but if the audio. we remove the dielectric... No, the audio is good. We can hear it. I don't know who said that. Well, we can hear it. From this field, it should not have any charge on it since the electric field is produced by the imbalance of this plate and this plate. So the real test of this free electron theory would be to remove the dielectric that's in this electric field and then use that same dielectric and discharge it using two different metal plates. And now I'll take off the electrodes and then discharge the energy that's stored in this capacitor. Okay, now we're going to remove the top and bottom plate so there'll be no metal. Switch the jar over to a completely different set of plates. All new metal, and then we're going to discharge it. And this should show that the energy of a capacitor is stored in the dielectric and not in the metal. This is a screenshot of the capacitor discharge that we just saw. You can better see the corona discharge that happens inside the bottle. There are also small corona streamers that you can see coming up around the bottom of the container. And then the obvious discharge and the lighting of the lamp. Another device I have is a Thomas Kim electroscope. So I built this one based upon his design and what's great is it shows the polarity of these dielectrics after you charge them. You can see the positive side on the bottom and the negative side on top. This is called a capacitor. Indeed, any two metal plates separated by some distance with stuff between a knot could be called a condenser or a capacitor. Now this one, you see, can be taken apart. This goes inside, and this goes outside, and I'm going to do some remarkable experiments. Now you watch what happens. Please. A little more. A little more. That's enough. Thank you. Now I am going to disassemble that. I'm going to take it apart. Watch how I do it. I have taken the innermost out, and I have taken the middle one out, and am I not connecting them all with abandon, right? 
would you not think that if I ground this to this and this to this, that all the energy would be lost? Would you not think so? Yes, beginners think this. But watch now what happens. I am going to assemble it. Watch. Get in close. Watch. Watch. Do you see? The energy is still there. How do you like that, Father? Isn't that amazing? So the question arises, how is it that I can charge this laden jar, disassemble its parts, reassemble it, and still have the energy there? Okay, it's now fully charged. And I take these insulated handles, overcome the Coulomb force, and then, oops, obviously there was never any charge on this metal at all. Oh, sure. The dielectric, no. <laughs> the dielectric, we can take out of the capacitor, we can roll it up. As and a matter of fact, I'll touch both yeah, plates. Yeah, both plates together. There's no, there's never was charge there. Okay. Where'd you put it on? And if you got across both those, it would knock you across this room. Now, we are going to check it. Okay, it was right at actually about 9 kV, okay? i got to be careful. As long as I'm not grounded, I should be all right. So, watch this. Okay, watch this. Okay. You can hear it's kind of staticky. So what I'm going to actually do is show you that it is, it is staticky. It has a static type feel to it. Okay. Now I'm going to roll this up. This way, I guess. We can check our voltage. It is nothing. Okay, I can touch this. Nothing happens. Wait, so it doesn't jump the gap there. Okay. Here we go. So it's sitting at about uh, 8 kilovolt, something like that. So now we're going to discharge it. Okay, so we're just going to clamp the ground on here. And we're basically going to discharge it. So here we go. Hear that spark? See that spark? Now I can touch it, no problem. Okay, yeah, I didn't realize that that video was that based. It is a, it is pretty good reminder though. This goes back to Charles Proust Steinmetz who pointed out the misconception of uh, this, the charge being stored in the plates. Uh, I mean, it's not specifically related to what the argument is, but I was basically like just going with generalized terms and stuff. And this is actually evidence of ether. That's because it requires counter space for storage. So basically it's the area between the coils or the area between the plates. And in this case, you actually have a dielectric material that stores the charge. Uh, yeah, I mean, Charles Protoss Diamonds explains this, and he uses the analogy of like um, of like a fence that holds in animals, right? And it's actually the area between the fence, the wires of the of the like electric fence that has the charge. It's not the actual wire. Same with the plates. It's the dielectric, and then that gets into counter space and how the charge is actually coming from counter space. It's the area between it. Um, which is pretty interesting, but that wasn't actually a sp that wasn't specifically about capacitors, turns out. But I, w I was only going to end it because that, uh, that's pretty fascinating. Most people just kind of think that uh, I'm pop Discord up. Most people just kind of assume that it's stored in the plates, but it's definitely not. It's a dielectric material between that. But anyway, um, yeah. So I can kind of just recap my argument here because it is it's like 130 but um 
Okay, so we have a vertical electric field on the Earth. And we have equipotential surfaces, it's 100 volts meter. It fluctuates, but then it goes back to its general uh, equipotential layout or lines, right? So it fluctuates based on environmental conditions and stuff like that, but then it goes back. So much so that we can actually predict what the voltage gradient will be, like what the electric potential will be based on altitude, just based on linear distance above the Earth. And it does fluctuate, but then whenever it kind of calms down, it gets back to that general uh, potential that's expected. And on a sphere, we should have a very consistent and predictable drop off from the surface. And then you would account for the change in the voltage gradient. So we have a vertical voltage gradient. We have linearity to the field and we have it, we have it increasing from the surface. Uh, whereas on a sphere with no um, additional Gaussian surface, you expect it to actually drop off as you get further away from the surface. You expect it to drop off. I mean, I say exponentially, it's pretty close, right? Because the further out you get, the more dramatic or drastic the drop off is. Um, you would expect uh, a radial distribution that's not linear. And of course, the antecedent to a vertical electric field is perpendicular plates. Specifically to replicate it in real life, you need two physical plates. You wouldn't have a finite volume, you would have no uniformity. And then, uh, as we see, the argument basically is, oh, well, it's, it's not uniform. And that's a conflation of the base uniformity and then the, the uh, subsequent variability. So hopefully I'm not going too fast with ideas there. But yeah, so the questions still remain, right? Like why does it drop off going away from this? Or why does it increase going away from the surface? And why is it linear? Why is there a linear distribution as opposed to a radial distribution? Um, and of course, what is acting as a second Gaussian surface? And trying to invoke the ionosphere doesn't work because within your own paradigm, and mind you, this is not actually measured within the globe paradigm, it's assumed. So if I send a radio wave out linear or like line of sight and it'll go too far, well, based on where it's received, people assume it must have bounced off of the ionosphere at a certain distance because the sphere would block it. And so since that distance constantly changes, which on a plane Earth is easy to explain, it's based on interference and attenuation of the signal. Right, so it's based on the environmental conditions between point A and point B, but in the globe paradigm, you're claiming it bounces down. Long story short, the ionosphere constantly fluctuates and at different places, so it's going up and down. And so it would, it would, it would uh, change and drastic greatly, I mean, uh, very greatly or drastically, specific to the uh, ionosphere, right? This is not what we see though. What we see is that it changes based on like, is the wind blowing, right? You have ionization of wind and then, um, is there like thunderstorm activity? Is there clouds? Is there static charge, et cetera? T topographical differences. But we do not see that all of those variables remaining constant or somewhat controlled, that it's just fluctuating based on the surface moving up above it, right? We see like a consistent distribution. We see a consistent distribution of the charge. Now, I want to address a couple more things. So, go ahead. Yeah, would you say that the flattness problem could be totally associated with linear distribution? The flatness problem? You know how it's stretched out flat, right? Everything's got a uniformity. It's symmetrical around us. So it's like stretched out wild, correct? So there's your, there's your um, linear distribution. That's the reason why. So stretched out so wide. What'd you say? When you say that? Oh, you mean like in the universe? Like the flatness yeah. problem of the universe? So, so, yeah, so the flatness problem just because it's so uniformed around us in a, in a, in a, I guess a, a flat is, I guess the way to put it because I did read the paper that you suggested looking at when Edwin Hubble, um, the observational approach to cosmology when he wrote mm -hmm. to Harvard and he kind of described it in that manner. And y'all were talking about linear distribution. And if you do look at what they call the cosmos, which I don't believe it's any of that, but I, it does look flat. So, yeah. Yep. You know, depending on what is over us, and like you suggested earlier, that it is really wide, and it doesn't have to be just like this tall dome. It could be so stretched out and massive that, you know, that's just how it works. So I just want to say I appreciate what you do. I believe in you. Everything that you've spoken about, I do lives on Facebook. I've learned a lot from you. Keep doing what you're doing because it's, people that are way intelligent aren't just from the 1800s. 
So keep doing what you're doing, man. It's awesome. Your work is awesome, brother. Thank you so much, bro. And uh, I really appreciate it. And I do understand what you're saying now. So like the flatness problem where they say the universe is effectively flat and it does look like that from the earth and they come up with all kinds of stories about infotons and stuff like that because it doesn't match their Big Bang cosmology. But yeah, that would fit right within yeah. with like some giant containment that's effectively serving as like a second flat parallel surface above us yeah. until you got to the edges. And the question I is, got a question where for are you. those? Good. Do I'm sorry to interrupt you. I got a question for you. So we have a north. This is um, a north pole. They say with a um, an iron like some type of great black rock, right? So is the force pulling to the north? What's it? Good question. So I think the north. Personally, I think that the north pole is in the sky. And I think that the okay. South Pole is below the Earth. I, I think that the center of the Earth is not a technical North Pole of a magnetic field. I, I think right. it's it's the center. I was looking at it, and the flux goes inward, doesn't it? Like if it's if it's going down, that's a southward pull, wouldn't it be? Well, yeah. I mean, you get into what is a North and South <laughs> Pole, which is a, is a whole rabbit right. hole. Was, yeah, yeah. but it does it, it goes and inward. Like your compass look. basically tilts down a bit. And that makes perfect right, sense right, when right. you have like centripetal convergence, meaning like the field is as a vortex and it's converging in at the center. The reason our compass is drawn that way is because that's the closest proximity of pressure mediation, meaning like we're not close enough to the north or south pole to affect our compass. Right. That's what I think. Right. Also, I'm 15 minutes from LIGO, Livingston. Oh, li wait, LIGO? I was, I was, LIGO. Yeah, LIGO. What is the the actual abstract for they found gravitational waves out somewhere? If you read that abstract and instead of looking at it as they're shooting it into the cosmos, look at it as a linear kind of view scope. When you go into the abstract, they talk about white noise and Gaussian noise and all these pink, all these noises. And then you start looking at what. It is actually, it's like a terahertz frequency, isn't it? That they're emitting two cross convergent lasers that create a, a, some type of frequency. Yeah. Isn't that correct? Yes. Okay, so imagine <laughs> this is a big topic behind this and what I'm, I, I read through the abstract and what they do in the same type of terahertz frequency. They kind of use in airports, correct? So, what if, what I'm just saying, it could be weird as like, I think they know it from it's up there which it, if you stop and think about it really you, you know what i'm saying if they if they are true scientists they already know they got funding from people that already know that they're you know that we have a closed system think about it so what are they really using it for just saying they yeah can, that's they can interesting register with, you know but, register like any kind of gouging noise they can depict it makes o tiles this frequency makes like these old tiles. So it's like a 6D CAD rendering of everything. And then you, if you want to go into like the atomic scale of what's in our atmosphere because of what's above us, that goes up, comes down, that they emit. It's in our substrate. It's in all of the like the foliage and all of our trees and stuff through the years. These scalar waves have this certain polymicro particle that is accepted. It doesn't kill any of our green, you know, grass and stuff like that. It's a natural poly particle. It's not good for us to breathe on a major scale. But anyway, I think that this frequency can pass through all of our substrate, basically, and 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 just focus on centralized areas. It's pretty deep. When you get into the abstract on it, you'll kind of get a, a better understanding of what I'm trying to explain. It does. Uh, stopping scalar is really difficult. I uh, have yeah, attempted to uh, basically uh, to block it or even, and I can base, can't can really block right. it, but I am able to like get it to change uh, directions slightly. Like you can kind of get it to bounce mm -hmm. a little bit, like depending on the mm -hmm. angle of like the, the materials you're using and you need like some really special alloys um but yeah it, that stuff is literally impossible to block yes i believe that i think i hear like and i'm not trying to they they, they call the um thing tinnitus and we have actual crystalline structures within our, our our ear cavity right like actual crystalline structures an actual element they say so i mean this is you know medicine but anyway so uh, you know, it's elemental 
there's fractal. It's all waves of potential energy. It's just awesome thing. And when you get into listening to like these teachings that Witsit's doing, Dave Weiss, you got Jaron. It's amazing because the truth, there's no scrutiny and it bears witness with the vessel. And that's what's so awesome about it. And that's what draws people in. So Witsit, keep doing what you're doing. And I just wanted to come forward and say this. We, Pebbles and I have been watching your shows forever. God bless you, man. Keep doing what you're doing. I want to sign off. Thanks for letting me uh, say a few things. I'm from Holden, Louisiana. God bless. Thanks. Thanks for saying something, man. Thanks for the kind words. I think it's a pretty crazy idea. I, I think that there may be some powers that be that can maybe know there's a containment, but it's pretty brilliant the way that they've done this. If you think you're on a sphere and you have an omnidirectional observable universe, then anywhere you are, there will be some type of uh, curvature to perceived curvature to the sky, although in an overall linear uh, like flat expression in all directions. So like if you were to receive signals, you think there's an ionosphere bending around the globe and it constantly fluctuates. That's going to, you're going to see that there's a change in the alleged curvature rate, but you're just going to think it's because the ionosphere is variable. You're going to do a lot of these tests and not really even know. And then whenever you don't know the medium that's above you, you're going to interpret it to be vast distances when in fact the propagation is going through a more dense medium, meaning that things would be much more local. You would just think that they're much further away. So all that to say, I think that within kind of like the reified pseudoscientific concept of this of this model they believe in, I don't. I think that the vast majority of people wouldn't know when you actually read their papers from LIGO and about gravitational waves and about antimatter and all that stuff. Like they're clearly lost in the sauce. There probably is a power that has taken the experimental data, like that of HARP as well, right, and LIGO, and kind of understanding, like, well, there's a theoric vibrational displacement, that's what we're actually observing, and there's a fluid, dense medium surrounding us. But I think that the vast majority of the people doing the test, they don't know, they run it through, like, neural networks, and they kind of just, like, cherry pick and reify their model. But I do want to say this real fast about the um, gravity thing. So, like, when I bring up, well, okay, I mean, if we want to talk about the cause of it, we can prove, of course, that you can pull the whole entire dynamic claim out of uh, this Newtonian belief of mass attracts mass and it's simply kinematic and that the mass attracting mass is, is not reliable, it's not viable, etc. And that's a whole different stream. It boils down to simply kinematic and you can directly falsify, even mathematically falsify the dynamic claim of mass attracts mass, even on the source of some scale. Shout out to M. Stone. He did that. He pointed it out. He explained like even the sun, earth, moon relationship doesn't work with the Newtonian dynamics mathematically. There's a whole problem with it, but the point is that they don't have a causal relationship, but the flat earth does, a plain earth does, and it is electric. And so when you look at it, you know, yeah, sure, you have 10 micro micro amps per square meter, but there's a lot of square meters, right? We have an insane amount of energy coming down from above us, and it creates this bias. It's 10 to 36 power stronger than gravity's even claimed to be on the smallest scale. So I want to go through... Um, this does. This is the follow-up of the fact that, of course, we have a again, we have a uniform vertical electric field. It slightly fluctuates based on environmental conditions, but the overall distribution is uniform and linear. So we have equipotential surfaces. So just envision in your mind a flat Earth, a plain Earth, and then like parallel lines coming up from that, just like we saw with Feynman lectures, 100 volts per meter, all the way up to anywhere that can be accessible, including with balloons 30 miles up or whatever. And then it's an, it's an equipotential linear increase from the surface, um, and it's exactly what you would get if you were to replicate it with two parallel plates. Now, you so when I did the parallel plates, and you saw in the in the documentary that I did, you saw Zach do it, Veritasium's done it, right? So we have everything discharging on the Earth in reality. Well, you'd have your negative plate, your positive plate. It would just stay exactly the way it is. You put something in it, it's going to go to the bottom plate. If you then put a Van de Graaff generator and you make the top plate the negative plate and you begin to introduce charge, electrostatic charge, what happens is it flips the polarity of the field between the two plates and the object will go up. So you're showing a direct manipulation with the directionality of the field between the plates and that changes the direction things go. So you've actually done science, right? The dependent variable, the naturally occurring observable phenomena is that objects go up and or down. You're trying to figure out the cause of that. Well, you 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 know, have a presumed cause or independent variable. You control your other variables, so like the density of the object, the density of the medium, etc. So you control those variables, let's say density, for example, and then you manipulate the independent variable or your presumed cause, which is electrostatics or the electrostatic field, right? And that the, that electrostatic field is actually going to cause the object to go up and or down. 
you manipulate that and you change the direction or the vector, which is magnitude and direction of the object. So you've proven scientifically there's a direct causal relationship between the electrostatic field, the environment electrically with the object and its direction. Okay, now, and again, on a small scale, it's 10 to 36 power strong, which gravity is even claimed to be. On a plane Earth, you do not need anything else to explain 9.8 meters per second squared. It's very nearly constant, it fluctuates, just like the downward electric current on the Earth is very nearly constant, but slightly fluctuates. It explains the phenomena of gravity perfectly. This is what people say back to supposedly rebut it. If that was true, well, then it would be um, like a dual pole, like dual polar, and so you have the positive and the negative charge. And they're not understanding, like, no, it's electrostatic. It's based on a voltage gradient, right? And you have a singular direction down, creating the bias, and then everything distributes relative to that. They will say, oh, well, if that was true, we'd be able to have anti-gravity cars or whatever right it would be super easy well that isn't true either so you, you can fully replicate it with something small and depending on your van der Graaff generator you could do it with something big but to try to make someone like a human levitate by manipulating the field you would have to kill them hundreds if not thousands of times over so far beyond a lethal amount that obviously no one's going to test that that doesn't mean that physics all of a sudden goes out the window and doesn't scale just because it would require so much voltage that you would kill someone, right? And so to say, oh, well, sure, you're actually manipulating the direction things go by in, you know, manipulating the independent variable, but I promise, or that doesn't count because you can't do it with something bigger, is ignorant. It's like dropping a ping pong ball in water and being like, sure, the density of the ping pong ball makes it float, but I promise until you, it doesn't count. Until you get the world's biggest ping pong ball and throw in the ocean, I don't believe you. It's like, okay, well, that's weird, and physics scales. It doesn't change, and you know, the mechanism is the same, blah, blah, blah. So those are like the two main things that you'll hear is like, oh, well, why don't things with different charges fall at different rates? Well, first of all, who's to say that they don't? Because things actually do fall at different rates and they fall at different rates during thunderstorm activity. And I know I'm covering a lot of stuff and maybe this will make people like to see it when I cover a lot of stuff. But like, who's to say they don't fall at different rates? Because they're in a thunderstorm activity, objects do fall at different rates, okay? And the, the rate that it falls is gonna change very slightly. It's very nearly constant. What a coincidence that the downward electric current, the electric field on the earth is very nearly constant. The rate at which things fall is very nearly constant. Now, Walter Lewin showed you the problem. He said, everything that controls what we see on the earth is actually run by electrical forces and everything is held together by electrical forces. And when you get on the big scale, when it comes to galaxies and planets and stars, that's when gravity takes over. Well, it's because in their model of an immense distances of a vacuum and huge masses, it doesn't work. Electrostatics is way too weak. Now, we don't have to believe in any of that, nor does it even have to be the same reason that things fall down. We have electrostatic field, vertical electric field on the earth, and then things in the sky could just be electromagnetic, right? Because we don't live in this confinement of, oh, things must be pulled omnidirectional to a sphere, so whatever's doing that must be the same thing that's pulling all these giant objects around each other in the sky. That isn't the case. Now you do need a force going around the central point on a stationary plane, and that is of course the vortex that we measure with interferometry, et cetera. It's a giant torus field. You have redshift because of electromagnetic retardation going out from the outside, and that's why we see redshift, you know, typically relative to what we perceive to be distance. And then we have a giant vortex, everything moving around. That is a force. You have a spatial extension of the magnetic, the convergent dielectric counterspatial component i know that that sounds it's words out whatever i'm not that's not what it's about but the point i'm trying to make to you is this is the key to what's going on the electric field on the earth is it's right in front of everyone and you go outside in a thunderstorm your hair sticks up bumblebees utilize this to pick certain flowers they they utilize this to even fly like it's right in front of you what's going on right and you have all kinds of sparks called lightning which are electrical discharges specifically dielectrical discharges and they're everywhere and we're constantly seeing this we're grounding things the fuel plane we ground it we know that everything is constantly receiving charge from its environment and if you don't ground it it could be dangerous we use this every day and it's, it makes perfect sense. It unifies everything on the quantum scale. Everything's electromagnetic. It's the strongest variable, right? And they reify all kinds of concepts below that, but it's too weak to find it, blah, blah, blah. So what I'm trying to tell you is there is, there is a very logical, intuitive, coherent explanation to where you live, all right? And it's that you're on a plane, that there's a surface above you parallel to you, 
right into the plane that you live on and there's just an, a finite volume that gives you equipotential increase right there's just a finite volume for the electric field and that there's energy up above you it comes down it kind of like breathes on you electrically it creates this bias to the ground everything seeks equilibrium based on that the, the quote-unquote molecules the matter itself is co is clumped together based on the electric charge and everything is just very simple Everything's very simple. It's what you see. Everything's electric. Well, how would gravity not be electric if literally everything that exists is electric? And gravity's not a bad word. It means weight. So I'm bringing all this up to say that I know that this is a foreign concept to people. And whenever there is um, a concept or, or evidence, let's say, a phenomenon that doesn't work perfectly in the globe, you won't hear about it. You know, like, you know, people haven't heard about the vertical electric gradient, the equipotential increase. Why have people not heard about that? Why is that not something you're taught? It seems like a pretty important variable or phenomena in life, right? Like you're surrounded in an electric field. Why would you not know about that? It's because the globe doesn't really have a fully functional model for it. They've moved the goalpost for over a hundred years. I don't know how to explain it. So that's why you haven't heard of it. And, and this is going to go full circle back to what the questions are. The questions are, why does the potential increase away from the surface? And why is it a linear distribution on a sphere? It should be radial. It should change predictably away from the, the surface of the earth. Um, it's going to spread out more and more. And so it's going to start to drop off more and more. And that is not what we observe.